adversely affect initial purchasers. The amended project, currently before the Council, modifies the project summary to allow HPD to forgive all or a portion of the land debt that is apportioned to a home upon conveyance to an eligible purchaser based on the home's appraised value and or if HPD determines that the forgiveness is necessary to reduce the taxable consideration for the home. HPD is requesting the amendment in order to address an unforeseen issue related to the New York State transfer tax surcharge. Accordingly, when the total consideration or contract price, which includes the subsidized sale price plus all subsidies and land value, exceeds $1 million, it triggers a surcharge to the ordinary New York, New York State transfer tax of 1% of the total consideration, the minimum of, of which is $10,000. This surcharge is a burden to low-income end purchasers, increasing down payment and closing costs. To avoid subjecting purchasers to this tax surcharge, HPD is submitting an application to amend the current public approvals to obtain authorization to reduce land debt to lower the total consideration for each affected property to under $1 million. The amendment makes no other changes to the project summary that was previously approved by the Council in 2016 for the project, which comprises nine two-family and four three-family homes containing a total of 30 units. Targeted household income for home buyers range between 80 to 130% of area median income. Each home will have a rental unit that will be affordable to families earning no more than the same AMI as the purchasing homeowner. In order to amend the project summary, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of land use item number 545. And I would just add that I also um, submitted a chart that shows um, for the um, five affected properties how um, bringing down the land debt uh, impacts the um, transfer tax surcharge for the affected homeowners. Okay, thank you. Okay, we do have a couple of questions uh, in behalf of Councilmember Barron. Okay. And we know that National Grid has declared a moratorium on new gas hookups, which is impacting housing developers and recent construction projects such as this one. And I might add uh, one in my district in Queens as well. What is HPD's response to developers who involved with projects who are involved with projects that will be impacted by this gas moratorium? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's definitely something that we're working on really actively. Um, this project in particular actually is impacted by it. Um, of the 13 homes in the project, um, six currently have gas connections and seven do not. Um, National Grid gave a deadline of May 15th, um, and I, I think, let's see, there were um, four of the homes on Hinsdale were able to get in their applications by that deadline, so we're hopeful that those will be okay. Um, for the three remaining homes on Blake, we are looking at options, and I would say just to speak to HPD's response generally, you know, it's very concerning for us. It does have a potential to create delays in um, and increased costs um, in projects currently in construction and within our pipeline. Um, so we are having active conversations with development teams who are who have projects that are affected by this. Um, to deal with it really on a one-on-one -on -one basis. There's really no one solution that works for everyone, um, but we're addressing it very proactively, um, you know, with a prioritization on projects that need to make their construction timelines in order to not lose their tax credits. Okay, so how will HPD ensure that increased costs associated with potential retrofits to electric power aren't passed along to tenants in affordable projects? I mean, I would say that's something we're still working through. This is, um, you know, kind of a, a new issue and we're working on it actively. I don't have an answer to that right now, but it's something that we're aware of and working on. Okay. Is HPD prepared to adjust their financing to account for the change costs of construction with electric versus gas? I mean, again, it's going to be a project by project um, consideration. Electric is not the only option. There's a couple other things that we're looking at as well. Um, and, you know, each, each project, we like to say, is its own special flower, so we have to find a solution that works case by case. 
Okay, thank you. Do my colleagues have any questions? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank Lisa. you. Appreciate it. We do have a member of the public wishing to testify today. No? Oh, all right, this item is closed. Is there anyone from the public that wish to testify on this particular item? Signed in? Okay, Mr. Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, fighter for the Rockaways and all the Queens, medical and religious freedom, and also all of New York City. The idea that there's no commitments here to what kind of work is going to be done on this, they say that it's for affordable, but what's affordable? The idea that the uh, national grid, they, they're not really given a full, full report on that, what national grid's going to do. How did the community council really vote on this? Because the program sounds all good, home ownership, but what kind of prices are there involved? Now, another thing, are they going to use union apprenticeship programs? Are they going to get the neighborhood real work? Or is this just another thing to get everybody thrown out of their neighborhoods where nobody could afford to live in them? Because they say affordable home ownership. The program sounds beautiful. I even spoke at 120 Broadway, but there's a lot of ifs and buts to this. And you know, like, this is very important because, you know, people, they want affordable housing and home ownership. You know, it sounds real nice, but they have to really check the stuff because if they don't check it and just give these guys a variance because they came with a fancy lawyer and a group of people, that's totally wrong. They really should be filled up with a lot of people because they did that in my, in Queens. I don't want to see that happened to everybody all over New York. Thank, Thank you, you very Jacobs. much. Thank you very much. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on the opening item? Seeing none, I now close today's public hearing and the item is laid over. Next, we will hear three applications submitted by HPD in connection with NME3, West 140th and West 150th Street, UDAP. LU547 is an application submitted pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the acquisition of property located at 209, 207 through 209 West 140th Street, Block 2026, Lots 24 and 25, and 304 through 308 West 150th Street, Block 2045, Lot 98, to facilitate a mixed-use development containing approximately 52 affordable housing units in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. LU 546 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the New York State General Municipal Law and Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the designation of an urban development action area and urban development action area project and the disposition of such property. The third related item is a pre-considered LU application number 20205116HAM submitted pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for an exemption from real property taxes for property located at 207 through 209 West 140th Street, Block 2026, Lots 24 and 25, and 304 West 150th Street, blocks, uh, Block 2045, Lot 98. We are once again joined today by representatives of HPD and the developer. Mr. Malcolm Punter, Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, and Lacey Tauber, who is still under oath. Council. 
Okay, you may begin. Um, land use items number 546 and 547 are related ULRB actions that seek approval for the development of three privately owned vacant lots at 207 to 209 West 140th Street and 304 West 150th Street in Manhattan Council District 9 for a project known as Northern Manhattan Equities 3 or NME 3. Land use number 546 is related to the acquisition of the disposition area and LU 547 is related to the UDAP designation project and disposition approval, as well as approval for pre-considered item um, for an Article 11 tax benefits. The disposition area was previously sold in 1994 and 1996 to be developed as accessory open space for rehabilitated residential buildings located at block 2045, lot 98, and as a new building with no more than four units at block 2026, um, lots 24 and 25. Today, the parcels remain vacant and underutilized. HPD will reacquire the disposition area and then dispose of it to facilitate the proposed project. NME 3 is slated for development under HPD's Open Door Program, which funds the new construction of cooperative and condominium buildings affordable to moderate and middle income households. Where dictated by lot size, the program may also fund the construction of new one to three family homes. NME 3 is the third phase of a three-phase project um, development process. The first two phases of this portfolio, phases one and two, preserved approximately 608 low-income housing tax credit units by extending the affordability levels out for another 40 years until January 1st, 2048. The development team proposes to conduct one six-story building and one 12-story building with a total of 52 cooperative home ownership units. The building to be located at 207-209 West 140th Street will have 10 one-bedroom and 11 two-bedroom units. The building to be located at 304 West 150th Street will have one studio, 10 one-bedroom, eight two-bedroom, and 12 three-bedroom units. The targeted household income tiers for this project will be between 80% and 110% of area median income, which is approximately $76,000 to $105,000 for a family of three. Sales prices are estimated to be to be between $200,000 to $320,000. Program guidelines require that the sponsor sell the homeownership units to households who agree to occupy their units for the length of the regulatory period. If the homeowner sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the homeowner may realize up to 2% appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Upon resale, the homeowner will also be required to sell to a household earning no more than the project's income limit. HPD is also seeking Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years coinciding with the length of the regulatory agreement to help maintain affordability of the homeownership units. In order to facilitate the NME 3 project, HPD is before the Landmark Subcommittee seeking approval of these actions um, to convey the sites to a new owner who will redevelop um, the area into affordable homeownership units. And I will turn it over to Malcolm from HCCI to talk you through the presentation. Okay, good morning. Good morning, uh, Council Member Adams and your colleagues. My name is Malcolm Punter. I'm the president of the Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement. We are a non-for-profit real estate developer that was created in 1986 in the central Harlem community, a community which 30 years ago did not uh, benefit from the appearance that it has now. HCCI has been developing primarily affordable housing for 35 years. Our charter, however, has dictated that we were responsible for developing very low income, low income, and middle income housing. Uh, and we are happy to present uh, this project to you and to the community of Harlem because we were able to initially uh, rehab, rehabilitate 608 units in about 21 buildings in the low income housing tax credit affordable program, which as you know, was created in 1986. However, the structure of that program uh, dictates that after a 15 year period, the tax credits that underwrote the affordable housing structure essentially expire. So what H which ACCI did was come back to the city council, HPD, and then the city council and the then uh, council member Inez Dickens supported us in reallocating the affordable housing structure to these buildings so that the residents will not experience any increases in rents. 
So we entered into voluntarily a 40-year regulatory uh, agreement with the city of New York, uh, and, and which, which guarantees that the residents of our buildings, the residents that we've uh, helped out for the last 35 years and, and grown to love and, and, and seen their children thrive in those affordable units, guarantee them to remain affordable for an additional 40 years. However, many of the residents of our buildings have increased their income through gainful employment. And I'll give you an example. We have several families that are civil servants in our buildings. And if we were to uh, try to accommodate them with a, a very low income apartment today, because for example, they, their household size increased, they may have originally went into a two bedroom, now they need a three or four bedroom unit, we could not help them. Our only answer to them would be, you have to go to Westchester or to Rockland County. Uh, so we have some available space in the cluster of the uh, preserved apartment buildings, and we want to commit that to middle income households in the form of home ownership. A cooperative home ownership program under the Open Door program instituted by HPD is that program that could help these residents, civil servants, stay in the Harlem community and not have to be displaced because the only thing they did wrong was become gainfully employed. Uh, so we ask that uh, the council support us in that. So I'd like to go through the slideshow very quickly to show you wh what we plan to deliver to the city. So the uh, West 140th Street lot is, is uh, about 75 feet, uh, uh, about 45 to 50 feet wide, and we are allowed to build under the R7 uh, designation, 75 feet, and we will uh, commit a, f a six story building to this uh, 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 building in, in this space, and it will be all uh, affordable co ops under the open door program. Uh, West 150th Street, uh, because this is north of 145th Street and along the Bradhurst uh, Park, which is a, a, a park that goes the length of 145th to 155th Street, and uh, we're, we're allowed to, it's an R8, so we're allowed to build up to 115 feet. So we're proposing a 12 story building. They will be all middle income uh, co ops. Uh, there's no retail to this uh, location, so we're preserving this all for units, uh, and, and there will be some programs that HCCI has initiated to help individuals become more prepared to purchase their home. For an example, we, we have uh, first-time homeowners programs, and on a monthly basis, HCCI uh, has 60 or more people that live in the community. Uh, many of them are, are Harlem residents who are looking to learn how to buy their first home. So these will be all first-time homeowners uh, through this program. And if they need some improvement in their credit, we have a credit builder program that we call the Lending Circles. Lending Circles helps uh, people socially uh, come together so in, in a, essentially a social lending program that is uh, sponsored by ACCI and also linked to the Fair Isaacs credit score, which many banks use to assess whether someone is mortgage ready. What we've seen uh, through uh, the two years that we've been operating this program, that people who dedicate themselves to the social lending are able to improve their credit score uh, about 30 points, which means could mean the difference between being eligible or ineligible to buy your first time home. We also uh, will have so plenty of amen amenities in the building. This is not uh, a cookie cutter process. We, we, we hope to you know, we've been creative, so we're going to have it, it fully handicapped accessible. We're going to have two uh, out, outdoor recreation space, uh, which speaks to, you know, the open space that was originally there. We'll have indoor community room space for residents. Uh, and also, uh, we will afford people bike parking for their, for their bicycles, which many people now can enjoy because the Jackie Robinson Park in the neighborhood has been... Uh, improved and, and, and no longer overrun with uh, difficulties in crime. And we also have in, in the in-building uh, laundry facilities and uh, there will be ADA compliant units. These are the f renderings of the building. Um, so you see that they are very modern looking, a lot of light, and we believe that this will be uh, pleasant to the community as well as to the residents who purchase their units. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I, I had a couple of questions just um, with regard to uh, community board concerns. One of them, I believe that you answered with regard to credit um, and the lending circle, um, was it lending circles, um, credit score building or builder training. So I think right. that addresses that, That's right. that issue. The, the other question was that the community board noted concerns about the AMI levels of the co-ops. Um, you have, or we have here, the anticipated sales prices of the units, but how does that compare to the surrounding neighborhood? So the AMI is the, the AMI that we selected is the lowest AMI on the home ownership spectrum. For example, typical home ownership that would be considered market rate home ownership would be targeted to families that make 120 to 165 percent of the area median income. Our proposal is to target the lowest b income ban in the home ownership structure. So that's 80 to 90 percent of AMI. Okay, uh, that's fine. The, the last concern would be, can you talk about um, the resale restrictions that would be placed on the co-op units to ensure ongoing affordability? So HCCI supports the resale restrictions. We will enter into regulatory agreements as a developer for the income restrictions that, uh, as defined by HPD. I think uh, Lacey mentioned those, and I'll ask her to repeat them. Yeah, it's a 2% appreciation per year during the regulatory period. And then if, um, if a homeowner sells during the regulatory period, they need to sell to an income qualified home buyer that matches the, um, the terms of the regulatory agreement. Okay, thank you. Do my colleagues have any questions for the panel? Councilmember Perkins? Yeah, I have a, a quick question too. Nothing that it's too complicated. It's just that when um, I hear these uh, numbers in terms of AMIs and whatnot, and um, I, I don't get a, a clearer sense as to what those numbers translate into uh, in, in sort of like dollars and cents. So what, for instance, a AMI of 80 to 90 percent, what does that really translate into in terms of what? Yep, we have that actually sense. right here on the slide, if you can see, or you might have the I presence. cannot see that from here. Oh, sure. you, you might have it in front of you. But um, so basically, it's around um, 60,000 to 127,000, depending on the, the unit size and the family size and the AMI in that range. And I just so, want to clarify that, you know, the, the sales prices are going to be targeted at um, those making 80 to 90%. Um, but marketed up to 110. That's why you see the 110 here, even though we said 80 to 90. That's just about who can qualify to give a little bit more flexibility and um, the ability to make sure we have good enough good qualified applicants. So I'm a little concerned. So is it 60 to eight, 60 to 80, or 80 to 90? 80 to 90 sales prices. Um, 80 to 110 percent for who and can it, apply. And translate into $60,000? $60,000 to 127, yeah, exactly. And your... Um, That's estimated your, numbers. Your estimated big. numbers. Those seem a little um, challenging uh, for, for the area. Uh, are there subsidies coming with this, uh, this project that will mitigate some of the um, difficult costs that folks in that area would, would, uh, would have to encounter? Yeah, yes. Uh, the, the problem, for example, if we try to give someone a rental apartment that is at 80% of AMI, they are excluded. They're absolutely excluded from the rental housing. Uh, with regard to the subsidy, uh, for example, ACCI just finished a project in Community Board 9 which is uh, located at 48 East 129th Street. And each resident of that building, the original residents, which there were six returning to, who returned to the building and are now living in the building, and the four vacant units which were marketed to the community through the HPD uh, Housing Connects program, they, they, all 10 of those households received a $40,000 subsidy because ACCI applied to the New York State Affordable Homes Corporation. 
and, and we're granted a $40,000 uh, allocation to subsidize the purchase of those units. We're going to apply again for the Affordable Housing Corporation New York State uh, subsidy, and, and if, if approved, we'll, we'll also get a $40,000 grant for each unit. Or, or also, some, somewhere about right. that. Mm -hmm. I would also add that HPD can work with first-time home buyers, and we have a down payment assistance program for those who qualify. So it, I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, it's uh, affordable in terms of what's in the pocket of the people that are in the neighborhood to get the benefit. It's, and, and, yes, sir. And I'm assuming that's what you just said <laughs> in, in terms of what I'm, I'm interested in, because very often we talk about affordable and it's really like beauty in the eye of the beholder and, and, and not necessarily in the pocket of the person that more or less has to afford it. So sure. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of it being really affordable from the perspective of the people in the neighborhood that are going to be getting the opportunity. The worst thing that has happened sometimes, too often, is that term results in people from the neighborhood um, having uh, dreams deferred, if you will, uh, because they, upon applying, ultimately cannot participate because their pockets don't meet the requirements. Yes, sir. And the example that I gave is an actual example of a MTA worker. He's a train engineer who lives in our building he came in, in in the early, uh, late 90s. He had a household of, of two, him and his wife, but now he has a household of six. They have four children. Uh, he makes about $110,000 a year. His wife cannot work because she's educated for fear that they will become ineligible for their two-bedroom apartment, which is located on 117th Street between Manhattan and Morningside Avenue. Um, um, so we really need to provide housing for, for that civil servant, which we have many in our buildings. We have police officers, we have MTA workers, we have firemen and women, and, and we want to serve them. And in the context of the 608 units that we preserve through the very low income affordable housing structure, we're asking to add 52 units for middle income households and ownership so that they can remain in Harlem as community members. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to take faith in, in your uh, explanation that um, I won't be hearing from my constituents saying, why would you support something that we can't afford that will ultimately put us out? So you're saying that's not going to be the case based on the numbers that you've been crunching, so to speak, yes, sir. Uh, to bring not, the well, project to Based on the quantitative numbers crunched, but also the qualitative experiences that we've had. We have 60 people attending our first home, home buyer program on a monthly basis. They're held on Tuesday and Thursday evening from 6 o'clock to 8.30. And everyone is welcome to attend. Oh, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. For mm -hmm. the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Perkins. Any other questions from my colleagues? I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Rivera and Powers and just to, and Council Member Miller who's walking in, just to conclude on the, the, the subject that my colleague Council Member Perkins just said, a lot of us in the Council are always very, very concerned about the term affordable housing and the question always comes back to those of us in, uh, in, in districts that may be subject to gentrification is affordable for who? So we just have to, we always keep that on the forefront. So I thank yes, Council Member Perkins for his line of questioning and I thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, I now recognize Council Member Miller for his vote on the first item. Council Member Miller on items 496 through 499 and 527 and 528, how do you vote? I vote aye. For the vote of four on the affirmative, zero on the negative, both zero abstentions. The vote is still held open. Thank you, the vote is still held open. Are there any more members of the public wishing to testify on the past item? I do have uh, Mr. Bruce Jacobs, is he still here? 
Okay, seeing none, I now close today's public hearing and these items are laid over. Our next two items are LUs 548 and 549, which are related to the East Coast Resiliency Project. LU 548 is an application submitted by the Department of Transportation, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to Section 197C of the New York City Charter for the acquisition of various properties along the FDR Drive in Councilmember Rivera, Chin, and Powers District for a flood protection system. LU549 is a related application submitted by the New York City Department of Small Business Services pursuant to Section 201 of the New York City Charter for an amendment of an article of Article 6, Chapter 2, Special Regulations Applying to the Waterfront Area of the Zoning Resolution of the, New of the City of New York, modifying special regulations for zoning lots that include parks located in a marginal street, wharf, or place, in an M1-1 district in Manhattan Community District 6. The East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, or ESCR, is the first of its kind in New York. This comprehensive flood protection system along the East River in Manhattan seeks to provide critical flood protection to more than 110,000 vulnerable New Yorkers. As the project has evolved over several years, communication of design changes has not always been clear. This has been an unfortunate part of the process. However, the need for flood protection is dire and time is of the essence. The ESCR will require the phased reconstruction of East River Park, an amazing open space resource that serves as the backyard for nearby residents, many of whom are low income and working class people of all ages. This community has had to grapple with a difficult question. One that communities across our city and globe will also be forced to answer in an unknown future. In the face of a changing climate, what sacrifices must be made in order to protect our community? I know this process has not been easy, and your council members have been fighting very, very hard to ensure that the impacts to the community during construction are lessened as much as possible. I will now turn it over to them for comments. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much. I want to thank Chair Adams for allowing me to speak on LUs 548 and 549, which would amend the zoning text to allow for the construction of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. It's fitting that we are holding today's hearing just days after thousands of New Yorkers participated in the Fridays for Future global climate strike. And even though one of our two major political parties is still debating whether climate change exists, it's clear to most of us in this city surrounded by water that our very survival depends on bold solutions. Later this month, we will all mark the seventh anniversary of when we first felt climate change impact our homes, the day Hurricane Sandy made landfall. While the memory of that terrible storm has faded for many Americans, the effects of the storm and what it did to the east side of Manhattan and the five boroughs can still be seen and felt today. Our neighborhood and many others are still recovering and rebuilding from the $19 billion in damage and economic losses that Sandy wrought. And for the families of the 43 New Yorkers who lost their lives, they will never truly be healed. As a former organizer who led the emergency community response to Sandy, and today as a council member who was responsible for the safety of almost 200,000 New Yorkers, I understand the seriousness of the crisis we face from climate change and increased sea levels and storm surge. I will continue to fight for the radical changes we need at the local, state, and federal level as we face a very real future where inaction and global temperature increases fill our world with wildfires and droughts and floods and massive animal die-offs and food shortages for millions. This is a stark, terrifying reality that we face as we consider the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, ESCR. I don't say this lightly. The stakes could not be higher, and I consider this to be the most important decision I have made so far and during my time in office. With stakes as high as this, it is imperative that we get this coastal protection plan done quickly and correctly for our community. Yep, yet up until very recently, our city has not seemed to grasp the seriousness with which they needed to treat the communities that are going to be impacted by ESCR. 
That's why Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and I knew we had to bring in our own climate change and resiliency experts to determine the best plan forward. We hired the Netherlands-based environmental consulting group Deltares to review the project's design and expect that report will be fully completed and released by early next week. We look forward to discussing the need for this review as well as the newly proposed plan by the mayor's office to construct the ESCR project in phases. This new plan, as announced yesterday, will allow for nearly half the park to remain open as the project is fully completed over five years with a portion of the project dealing with flood protection in place by 2023. Council members Chin, Powers, and I were happy to see the city finally listening to our community and acting on one of our constituents' biggest demands. However, I must reiterate once again that providing this information just one day before the hearing is unfair to our constituents and the advocates. And while we are happy to discuss this today, DDC has to work harder to live up to their promise for transparent and current communication. Beyond phasing, we have received updates on a number of other demands from city agencies that are also promising. The Parks Department recently shared a proposed schedule for local youth sports teams that will allow them to continue playing at local ball fields throughout the project timeline. And while we are still negotiating this schedule, many of the coaches and I are encouraged by the progress that we have made. Beginning this fall, parks will also be planting 1,000 trees throughout the project area, creating 40 bioswells to reduce street ponding, installing new lighting at six neighborhood sports fields, making improvements to turf fields at six sites, applying new sports coatings and painting at various parks and playgrounds, enhancing family barbecue areas, including the LaGuardia bathhouse demolition area for a field, sprucing up 16 NYCHA park and play sites, hiring nine new park staff, for the neighborhood and committing to keeping all East River Park staff on the east side of Manhattan below 34th Street. We will also be meeting with DLT and other elected officials in the coming week to determine a sufficient detour in Alphabet City for cyclists who rely on the East River Greenway. As First and Second Avenues and a partially open Greenway are just not going to cut it. But I also expect the mayor's office to provide further updates to us today on a number of issues that have not been addressed sufficiently. This includes interim flood protection measures, IFPM, during construction of ESCR. In a letter to our offices, DDC Commissioner Lorraine Grillo wrote that an analysis of existing conditions did not find IFPM to be an effective solution for the ESCR area. While IFPM may not be designed to protect neighborhoods from sandy level events, they can ensure critical infrastructure remains operational during more frequent, less severe storms, and we want more details to the analysis that led to your findings. The city must also commit to a study for the greening of FDR Drive, which has for too long been an environmental injustice for Eastside communities and must be rectified as part of our collective vision for a cleaner city. And the project team must develop a hazardous material mitigation plan that goes beyond typical mitigation efforts to ensure the safety and health of all New Yorkers, including updates to residents and community leaders on air quality levels, similar to what was done with the L train tunnel repairs. And these are just a few of the demands that we have sent to the mayor's office. I also want to acknowledge and address the hundreds of community leaders who have rallied and fought to make this resiliency plan one that actually works for the Lower East Side. Our collective demands have forced the city to come to the table and reconsider their plan after months of unanswered questions. As we enter this critical phase of the ULERP, I must reiterate the importance of advocacy that is rooted in expert science and data, not speculation and misinformation. We cannot allow our community to be pitted against each other from NYCHA residents to environmentalists. I'm relieved the city came forward with an improved modification to their plan but remain disappointed that we were ever put in a position where unfounded rumors of real estate speculation, mistrust in government, and ulterior motives became dominant themes in a conversation that should have been focused on access to open space and flood protection for our families. For me, nothing is more important than our families. I grew up in the Lower East Side, and my family emigrated from Puerto Rico, another place that has been ravaged by climate change. I grew up in East River Park, my home park, the park where I have countless memories and a place I enjoy to this day. I learned to ride my bike in the drum circle and along the esplanade. I played, and usually won, 
softball games in East River Fields. I've barbecued with friends and families on hot summer days by the 10th Street Bridge. East River Park is a part of who I am. And now to represent this neighborhood that is home to countless NYCH residents, activists, free thinkers, and families is an immense point of pride. As a lifelong resident of our beloved Loisida, the factors of this decision have been unnecessarily difficult to weigh. I feel it is my responsibility to ensure we get a protection plan that we can truly say takes care of all of us, but most of all keeps us safe for generations to come. In closing, I will just reiterate what I've been saying from the beginning. ESCR will set the tone for all future coastal resiliency projects, and if the city wants the vote and confidence of the three host council members, they need a plan worthy of our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rivera. I'm going to ask those holding signs. Once again, you've been warned by security. We do not want to remove you from the room, so please do respect the rules of the chambers. Thank you so much. We've been joined by Councilmember Chin, who will ask for remarks at this time. Okay. Thank you, Chair Adam, for holding this important hearing. The administration's East Side Coastal Resiliency, ESCR project, has sparked an important discussion about the best ways to improve the environmental protection in New York City. As the representative of Lower Manhattan, one of the area that was the hardest hit by Superstorm Sandy, I know that improving the resiliency environmental health of the neighborhoods in Lower Manhattan has been long overdue. At the same time, we know that East River Park is a beloved green space for so many residents, especially community of colors. Balancing New York's preparation for the impacts of climate change with the needs for publicly accessible green space must be a priority as City Hall moves forward with this plan. While the administration's recent announcement that they will be phasing construction in the park indicates that they are listening to the community, um, but questions remain about the details of this change and the potential impact. Today's hearing is an important opportunity for the administration to provide some answers to our concern um, and also to be able to hear from the residents. I wanted to thank my colleague, uh, Keith Power, because we, we share the part of the park, but especially Council Member Colina Rivera. She has the bulk of the park. Um, and her staff, who's been taking leadership on this. Um, and her advocacy has been tremendous. You know, we're very, very supportive of her, and we are so happy that the administration finally did hear from us and from all those meetings that you have attended. And it makes a difference. When we finally heard that 42% of the park will remain open during this construction, because everybody's been asking, why couldn't we phase it? Why do we have to close the whole thing? And so we got a, some assurance uh, from the administration that at least 42% of the park will remain open, and that's a big deal. But going forward, we want to make sure that all the green space that we'll promise during the interim period becomes a reality, and a lot of us will be asking some of those questions later. So. Thank you again, Chair Adam, for ho holding another important hearing, and thank you to all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Chin. We'll now hear from Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, good morning, and thank you for everybody for being here and taking time out of your day to be here as part of this important conversation. Um, as I think Councilmember Rivera noted, it's, it's really impossible to have this conversation without thinking about why we're here back in 2012 when we had a superstorm that in my neighborhood in Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper, where we lost power, streets were flooded, cars were underwater, buildings were damaged, and some services offline for multiple years, and much more. And and seven years later, I still remember walking through my neighborhood as the power went out. I remember the water rising over Stuyvesant Cove Park as I sat there and watched it come over. I remember coming up 14th Street. I remember looking over and seeing the flooding of the cars on Avenue C. And the days and the weeks after that, as the National Guard actually headquartered themselves in Stuyvesant Town, uh, it's the community center there and um, went out to no-go knock on doors to make sure people, especially seniors, who uh, were li living in apartments where there was no power, had access to food and prescription medicine and all sorts of um, resources. 
Um, that leads us to where we are here today, and I, I am happy that we're having a conversation and moving forward with a plan to act in response to that moment. Um, this, this project, in my, in my view, will bring essential protections from storms and flooding, and especially in Project 2, which is my part of the, this plan, um, for Stives in town and Peter Cooper Village and other surrounding areas. Um, it doesn't come out without disruption, as we know. This means, in, in, for my constituents, the closures of partial closures of East River Park. It means taking Murphy Brothers Playground off uh, line for a portion, Stives and Cove Park, Astor Levy Playground, um, all to do installation of flood protection and rebuilding the parks. Um, this is going to impact the everyday users of the park in my district who run uh, and, and bike and you know take advantage of the open space. It's going to affect the Little League that I played in, the Peter Stuyves, the great Peter Stuyves in Little League, who uses this space, Solar One, a great institution. It's going to impact uh, many of those and many of those here today who rely on that as their space, their public space. Um, but like all projects that come before the council, we have, we, I think we all share the goals, uh, but the difficulty is the implementation of the project. And um, obviously in a piece of news yesterday that was I, I view as good news, um, we have a round of changes that will allow for the park and the East River Park to be open in some portion for the entire entirety of the project. Um, that is, and I will say this publicly and I'll say it very clearly, a call that came from the, the council members that were here and the other elected officials um, and the community to phase this construction. I think we always believed it was possible and um, it's really the result of a year, I think, or a year plus of discussions between the council members and the administration. I think we all believed we could do coastal residency while preserving open space and this plan gets us a bit further in those goals. And I, you know, today I think we'll be looking forward to hearing more about the new updated plan and asking questions about the new plan uh, and, and the implementation of it. Um, I share with the comments that were made earlier, which is as elected officials, we have to look at the, the big issues in our districts um, and ensure that we are properly protected from the next storm. For my neighbors and myself, getting adequate protection against the superstorm is really essential and the plan is a step forward in my, in my view to do that. Um, I will have a number of questions today and be looking forward to looking for more information about the new plan, particularly in my area around Phase 2, Murphy Brothers Park Playground, Stuyvesant Cove, Astor Levy, Playground, Astor Levy Playground, and the phasing of those and how construction will impact those neighborhoods. Um, I just want to say I think, and I think Councilmember Chin said it, but I don't, I don't think we would be even at a part of phasing uh, the park if we didn't have um, a strong, for the, I don't, I'm not even gonna, I don't represent that area, but for those who represent that area, including Councilman Rivera, if they did not draw a hard line in the sand that that was essential as part of a plan. I know that my, some, I've heard from my constituents, are ha they're happier that we are with uh, a plan that phases, so I'm grateful for the collaborative effort to get to even this part. I think all of us would like to see as much open space preserved and kept open through this project, and I think as we get to a final vote, we'll be looking for clear answers if we can go further than what's there today. So with that, I'll hand it back over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Powers. We're joined today by representatives of the Departments of Design and Construction, Parks and Recreation, and the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. We're joined by uh, Commissioner Lorraine Grillo, DDC, Jamie Torres Springer, First Deputy Commissioner, DDC, Mitchell Silver, New York City Parks Commissioner, Alyssa, I'm sorry, I, I can't read you. Cobb, Conan, thank you. Um, also from New York City Parks. And Janie Banshee, Director, Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Before you begin, Council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands and say your names. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Thank you again, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the subcommittee. I am Lorraine Grillo, Commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, ESCR, we call it. I first want to acknowledge Council Members Rivera, Powers, and Chin, whose leadership and advocacy on behalf of their communities has truly shaped the city's approach. The project you are considering today is unprecedented in New York City. 
ESCR will create a miles-long system of protective barriers, flood walls, and floodgates, new sewers, and drainage upgrades covering much of the Lower East Side, and a rebuilt East River Park, literally lifting it out of the 100-year floodplain in order to protect it from a changing climate. The project is uniquely challenging from a, construct, from a construction perspective. We can't get this wrong. When I arrived at DDC last summer, I was given one mandate by Mayor de Blasio to ensure that the agency performed at the highest level and delivered our projects on time and on budget. With this in mind, I came to DDC while ESCR was undergoing a careful top to bottom constructability review. That review found significant constructability issues that put the project at risk. I detailed those issues at length when I testified before the council in January. We knew we had to find a better approach. Our solution has not only reduced construction risk, we can also deliver flood protection one full hurricane season sooner than the previous plan in 20, this time in 2023. This achievement should not be glossed over. We have eliminated years of loud and disruptive nighttime pile driving across the street from thousands of NYCHA residents, an issue I have mentioned time and again. Let me say it again. The previous approach would have required years of nighttime pile driving across all of NYCHA's housing along the East River Park. The current approach does not. We eliminated massive risk posed by the previous approach, which required digging up a major Con Ed transmission line that delivers power to most of Lower Manhattan. We no longer have to do this because we've moved construction of the flood protection away from the FDR and the Con Ed line. Away in the Con Ed line, away from thousands of nearby residents and closer to the East River. What's more, ESCR will now protect the park itself and its many new amenities from the same coastal flooding risks as the rest of the neighborhood, which was not the case with the earlier approach. It also bears repeat, repeating that the previous approach would have also required extensive long-time closures of East River Park. What's more, the vast majority of existing trees would have also had to be removed, a fact we shared in early 2018. We all have to acknowledge that ESCR is a massive undertaking, no matter how you approach it. But let's look forward to get flood protection in fall of 2023. We have an aggressive construction schedule we break ground next spring and have already hired a program management team to assist with day-to-day -day oversight and ensure the project stays on schedule. Construction contracts will have meaningful incentives for contractors to deliver the project on time and penalties for delays. And let me come to the perhaps the most important construction question providing ongoing access to recreation for the community during construction. This has been a top demand from the community and elected officials. Commis Commissioner Silver will share a robust interim recreation plan. Meanwhile, the team at DDC has been working tirelessly to develop a construction phasing plan that also lives up to this goal. After many, many iterations, we found one that keeps almost half of the East River Park open at all times. The community and its elected representatives have been clear. Access to recreation must be a top priority, and we have found a way to accomplish this and still ensure flood protection in time for the 2023 hurricane season, even if the final touches to the project will take a little longer. We will walk you through the details of this plan in a moment. But I am proud of the significant change driven by the community, and it makes this project better. 
We are also committed to providing the community with some of the economic benefits of this $1.4 billion project. We are working to ensure access to labor pre-apprenticeship pre programs, an important pipeline to career opportunities. We will aggressively pursue a 30% goal of contracts awarded to minority and women-owned businesses. We are also required to provide extensive targeted recruitment and employment opportunities to low-income individuals and be, we'll be working with SBS and local leaders to ensure these opportunities are well publicized. There have been lots of questions about how construction ex itself will proceed. Let me assure the Council that we will follow all health and safety guidelines to the letter. DDC will also provide dedicated full-time community construction liaisons, or we call them CCLs, for, for the duration of the project. The sole focus of these CCLs is to work on site every day during the construction to interact with the residents, community boards, and businesses to provide constant construction updates and resolve any issues on the ground in real time. Since last fall, we have participated in nearly 100 meetings, town halls, working groups, and other forums, large and small. It is due in part to this engagement that community boards three and six, the Manhattan Borough President, and the City Planning Commission have all reviewed and approved the projects with conditions. We have heard each and every concern brought to us. Our response to them is reflected not only in the phasing, but also in specific park amenities requested during our meetings, better waterfront access, and other changes to the park's design and construction. In closing, I want to thank the community and its elected leaders for driving us to a better approach for more resilient New York City that will keep this community safe for generations. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I'd like to thank Chair Adams and the other members of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Dispositions for this opportunity to discuss the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project and the resiliency benefits it will provide for more than 110,000 New Yorkers. Commissioner Grillo just spoke to how this project will be built. Now I would like to speak to why it is so urgently needed. Seven years ago this month, New York City experienced a level of devastation that will never be forgotten. As darkness fell on the evening of October 29, 2012, Hurricane Sandy roared into New York Harbor. At the Battery, its storm surge reached a peak of nearly 14 feet. Along the east side of Manhattan, a violent flood of salt water swept over bulkheads and into the streets, reaching as far as Avenue B. Thousands of lives were upended. Recovering from the damage, which was extensive, has taken years, and a highly coordinated effort involving the federal government, numerous city agencies, homeowners, businesses, and more. As Hurricane Sandy so tragically demonstrated, climate change is an emergency that cannot be ignored. Since then, the global forecast has only become more distressing, with new reports showing that we have less time to act. Last month, millions of young people participated in global climate strikes, including here in New York City. They are giving voice to the fears many have about a warming world, a world that will have more hurricanes, more droughts, an extinction crisis, and temperatures so high that some areas may even become un un uninhabitable. Our mission is to prepare our city and its residents for these impacts. This is a moral imperative, and our responsibility is not something we take lightly. To combat the threats we face, we are investing over $20 billion into resiliency citywide, focusing first and foremost on our most vulnerable areas and those neighborhoods that were hit the hardest by Hurricane Sandy. The investments include some of the most advanced and innovative resiliency efforts anywhere in the world. The ESCR project is one of several major coastal resiliency measures underway across the five boroughs. Its scope is ambitious. As I mentioned earlier, this project will protect over 110,000 New Yorkers from the threats of flooding from sea level rise and storm surge. Critically, this includes thousands of low-income families living in NYCHA developments located in the floodplain. 
The ESCR project won't just protect the New York City of today, but also the New York City of 100 years from now. Our resiliency planning utilizes the best available scientific projections, and we are fortunate to have an independent panel of highly credentialed climate scientists advising us. Their work clearly shows that future storms will be intensified by rising sea levels. We are accounting for that by building this project to withstand hurricanes <coughs> much more powerful than Sandy. If unanticipated factors cause sea, level rise to, sea levels to rise beyond present day projections, two additional feet of protection can be added in future decades thanks to an adaptable foundation design. It's no exaggeration to say that this project will protect generations of New Yorkers, even as the threats associated with global warming continue to worsen. We refuse to be daunted by the challenges we face. We're approaching our work to adapt New York City to climate change with determination, grit, and the utmost urgency. We're doing so because our very future depends on it. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. I would now like to welcome Commissioner Mitchell Silver from the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, members of the Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Dispositions, and other Council members. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you for inviting us here today to provide an update on the East Side Coastal Resiliency Projects, also known as ESCR. I'd like to begin by recognizing the local council members for their advocacy and leadership regarding this project, including Council Members Rivera, Chen, and Powers. I'd also like to thank Commissioner Grillo of the Department of Design and Construction and Janie Bovici from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency for providing such helpful information and context for this massively important project and for being incredible agency partners in this effort. While you've just heard about the benefits and protection that this large scale resi resiliency investment will offer for 110,000 New Yorkers on the east side of Manhattan, today I'd like to also provide our agency's perspective on how this project will vastly improve East River Park and other nearby parks for the betterment of both local community and the city at large. Since I serve as Parks Commissioner of the largest city in the United States and have decades of experience in the field of urban planning, I've had the privilege of engaging with planners, policy experts, and park advocates from across the globe. And increasingly, cities around the world are more directly facing the challenge of a disturbing environmental and ecological trends and patterns. As you've heard from my colleagues from the administration, when it comes to global climate change, we are at a reckoning point, and cities need to incorporate resiliency measures into every aspect of urban planning, including our parks and open spaces. This ESCR project will transform East River Park into a modern, climate-resilient park designed to withstand the dangers posed by sea level rise and climate change, so that the park can continue to serve as a valuable public resource for years to come. New York City Parks fully and enthusiastically supports this project, which, thanks to the hard work of our partners at DDC and other agencies, now has a greatly improved, smarter design, which will result in a better park going, uh, park going experience for New Yorkers to enjoy. To be clear, East River Park is already experiencing the impacts of climate change and is at serious risk. The park Esplanade experiences flooding on a regular, nearly monthly basis, which has led to park closures and increased maintenance and repair work. Through the improved design and approach, <laughs> through the improved design approach, the park will be literally elevated and removed from the floodplain so the park can better withstand future climate challenges. Without this project, East River Park and the Upland community will be subject to continued increased flooding due to more frequent and extreme storm events and rising sea levels. Further, the project will provide incredible improvements and benefits for the park and honor the connection that New Yorkers have to our public waterfront, which is especially important for us as residents of a coastal city. To mention one critical example that will beneficially be added to the scope as the design of the project evolved, ESCR will construct and strengthen the waterfront bulkhead, which is currently in poor condition. As members of the subcommittee are well aware, bulkhead repair reconstruction 
is a critical investment for waterfront infrastructure, especially for retaining safe waterfront parks, particularly as waterfront conditions change and evolve. If not addressed now, this work will need to be done at a future juncture, leading to unnecessary additional park closures. This project represents an incredible opportunity to implement a modern park design for East River Park, one that reflects the community's current needs. Through the years of community input involved with this project, we heard a consistent theme, loud and clear. East River Park is a beloved community space with a wide variety of features and amenities, and local residents want to be assured that the essential program and utility of the park will remain the same. I am pleased to confirm that this improved design does just that, preserving the general layout of East River Park while also improving to the park thanks to design universally accessible bridges as well as generous welcoming entry points, not to mention a flyover bridge over the pinch point at 14th Street that has long been desired by the community. The earlier version of the project design relied on heavily on significant use of flood walls along the FDR Drive, but this improved urban park design will minimize the separation and provide much improved visual sight lines into the park, reconnecting the community and the waterfront park they need and deserve. Through this project, we will be also able to provide entirely renovated facilities and amenities that New Yorkers know and love, including the amphitheater, adult fitness equipment, ball fields, tennis courts, soccer and multi-use turf fields, track and field, basketball courts, playground, comfort stations, and picnic and barbecue areas. We're also seizing the opportunity to provide completely new facilities and uses, uses that do not currently exist, including multi-purpose passive lawns, an additional playground, additional basketball courts, and a brand new adult fitness court challenge, and solar lighting, all at elevations above the floodplain. Lastly, as you've already heard, from our agency colleagues, we are especially pleased that the reconstruction of East River Park will be phased to allow continued access to significant portions of the park as construction is underway. As with many major capital projects of this scale, the complexity, we understand that there will be significant impacts and inconveniences for the public. Regardless of the design approach being considered, the city would have to rebuild the majority of East River Park, a massive undertaking. We will temporarily relocate existing sport league permittees that currently use the ball fields and are prioritizing their access to alternate park facilities. As you will hear in more detail shortly, we have already begun implementing improvements to nearby park properties that will increase interim access to recreational space for the duration of the closure either through short-term enhancements or capital work that is underway. Through our public engagement, the enthusiasm of our urban forests, particularly the trees within East River Park, has become abundantly clear. In the park's current configuration, East River Park's trees are increasingly at risk from saltwater damage. In 2014, New York City Parks had removed 280, 258 trees from East River Park that had suffered salt water damage after Hurricane Sandy. As if East River Park were to remain in its current configuration, it is likely that many of the park's remaining trees will be lost to old age or salt inundation from routine flooding or large storm events in coming years. Due to the need to elevate the park by several feet, the project will require the removal of nearly all the trees within East River Park but we are pleased to say that over 1,800 new trees, a net increase of 750 trees, we planted in the project area above the floodplain in a new planting pallet of 52 species that includes native salt tolerant species. Additionally, approximately 1,000 trees will also be planted in the surrounding neighborhood so that residents of the east side can all better benefit from increased urban tree canopy. Realigning Realigning our tree planting strategy in accordance with the best practices for resiliency in combination with the elevation of the new park means that these trees and plantings will have the best chance of surviving future extreme weather, be it a drastic storm or rising temperatures. Though the project of this size will always present challenges and costs, 
We're pleased that ESCR project will help deliver an improved park experience for visitors to East River Park and other nearby open spaces, rebuilding them better, smarter, and stronger. As I have hoped we've demonstrated today, improving and protecting our city's park system for the 21st century is a guiding principle for this administration and New York City parks. We're excited about the opportunity to deliver a world-class park for the community, and we look forward to bringing an improved open space and waterfront access along with the comprehensive flood protection for this densely populated area of New York City. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you today and for your great advocacy for our city parks. I would now like to introduce Jamie Torres Springer, first deputy commissioner at DDC, and Alyssa Cobb Conan, New York City Parks Deputy Commissioner for Planning and Development, who will give a short presentation to offer more details about this project. Thank you, Commissioner. Before you do, I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Ines Barron. And our vote is still open. Council Member Barron, your vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I vote aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, all items are approved for referral to the Full Land Use Committee. And the vote is closed. Thank you, Council. And uh, just as a point of housekeeping one more time, uh, for those of you that don't know, I am a former, former community board chairperson of the second largest community board in Queens, and I'm no stranger to public meetings, town halls, and, and any other contentious meetings that may be had in a single community in a single moment in time. So that said, I am going to ask your indulgence, your patience, and most importantly, your respect in these chambers. If you have signed up to speak, you will have your time to speak and let your voices be heard on this very important matter. We know that emotions are very, very high today, but we must all be respectful of each other in these chambers so that all testifying can be heard by you. If you're making noises, we can't hear them, and your peers in the room cannot hear them. So I will respectfully ask you to, again, respect the rules of these chambers. Let's maybe not enjoy so much the process, but let's obey and respect the process. Thank you very much. You may continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Council Members. Deputy Commissioner Cobb Conan and I will provide a brief overview of the project uh, with emphasis on the phasing approach that was announced by the Mayor yesterday. Uh, so the four goals that have driven ESCR since the outset are to provide a reliable, integrated flood protection system uh, in order to address various levels of flooding for the community and other climate hazards, uh, to at the same time improve waterfront open spaces and access. Uh, and then uh, the project has uh, $338 million of federal funding, and so tied to that is to build a project that has what we call independent utility, uh, meaning it, stand on it stands on its own for addressing flooding within the community, and it's been designed to do so. And then, of course, to respond as quickly as possible to the urgent need for increased flood protection and resiliency. Um, the the uh, project area uh, adjacent particularly to East River Park um, uh, is pictured here, um, and we have 110,000 residents in the future 100-year floodplain as projected in the 2050s. Uh, so the science tells us that uh, th this community uh, is one of the lowest lying uh, in the city. It's the lowest lying edge of the East River in Manhattan. Uh, and as I say, 110,000 residents exposed to that 100-year 100, 100 flood, including, as we've emphasized here and is top of mind, uh, about 15,000 residents of NYCHA housing, uh, many of whom live immediately adjacent to the FDR Expressway and East River Park. So that's what we're uh, trying to solve for here. The project in overview uh, has the features that we've described uh, many times in the past uh, it, and have been described by the commissioners. Uh, it raises East River Park out of the 100-year floodplain to protect the park and serve as a barrier to the community. Uh, barrier for flooding to the community with flood protection built underneath. Uh, in areas where uh, we don't have as wide an edge, uh, we have a series of flood walls that are connected via gates to the north and south in order to provide that complete protection. In addition, there are upland drainage improvements to uh, help us deal with water uh, during a heavy rainfall that coincides with a coastal flood event. 
uh, and also interceptor gates that will prevent water from coming from the north and south, again, so we can have that independent utility for the project. Also, has, as has been mentioned, the project involves rebuilding the bulkhead, which is in poor condition uh, in East River Park, and rebuilding all of the sewer systems inside the park, which are aging and will need replacement. Uh, the project also improves open space and waterfront access. Uh, 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 Deputy Commissioner Cobb Conan will get into the, the overview of the new park. Uh, we also are replacing three bridges, and uh, including the flyover bridge uh, at the so-called pinch point at 14th Street. Uh, also should mention we will be keeping ferries running from Corlears Hook and Stuyvesant Cove throughout construction. Um, so uh, turning to the schedule for construction, uh, this is an unprecedented uh, complex construction project, as we've uh, emphasized uh, very often. Some of the construction issues that we have been grappling with over the last year as we advance design uh, include the location and interconnectedness of the underground sewer infrastructure underneath East River Park, uh, which again uh, does need to be replaced uh, eventually, and we're able to replace it during this project. Uh, also, the um, settling time associated with fill that is brought in uh, to raise East River Park. To be clear, there was a substantial amount of fill needed in the prior project approach as well, um, but fill needs time to settle, and so sorting out how to deliver this project effectively, uh, incorporating that fill settling time has been complex. Of course, looking at ways that pedestrians and uh, pedestrians can safely access portions of the park. Uh, while our construction vehicles also need to access portions of the park. And then when it comes to phasing, how we would construct where we need to, temporary pathways, uh, walls, drainage, et cetera, in order to make the park occupiable. At the same time, um, the two goals that are uh, emphasized on the right, certainly the goals uh, that, that the mayor has emphasized with us are, are to complete the flood protection as early as we can, so still to complete that flood protection, by mid-2023, and then maximize public access to open space during construction. And so that's led us to the phasing plan that we've announced uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, so um, what we had before was a plan where we were looking at a full closure of the park and delivery of the overall project within about three and a half years. Um, what we have moved to, been able to move to at this point is a plan in which nearly half of East River Park is always open at all times during the construction of the project. Um, we've tried to illustrate this here by showing what the picture looks like each summer during the construction phase. So I'll just walk through that uh, in order to, uh, to, to describe that. First of all, no closure of any portion of East River Park until the fall of 2020. So we're going to be able to start the construction project with some other early works and not close the park uh, next uh, summer. So it will be open that season. The first phase of construction is from the fall of 2020 to spring of 2023. Uh, as you can see here, this describes the first phase. The vast majority of the park areas from Delancey to Houston Street, so the bulk of the middle of East River Park, will remain open as well as the amphitheater area in the south and the portion of the park from approximately East 10th Street to East 12th Street in the north. As is stated, this represents about 42% of the park area. Uh, users of the park will be able to access these spaces via Corlears Hook Bridge, Delancey Street Bridge, uh, the Houston Street Overpass, and the 10th Street Bridge. Um, uh, the other areas will close and construction will commence on those areas. The next year, uh, in the summer of 2022, um, we have the scenario I've described for about two and a half years, so from late 2020 to mid-2023. So in 2022, you're in the midst of that first phase, you have that same scenario, uh, just with a couple of notes. First of all, uh, we've noted that the Pier 42 project, which is the construction of a park um, to the south of East River Park, is scheduled to be completed in the spring of 2022. So that second summer, Pier 42 will be online. Um, in addition, uh, as we move from 2022 to 2023, uh, in late 2022, we need to close the esplanade for the extent of the park. Uh, we'll be able to maintain park use in all the areas behind the esplanade, but the esplanade is the location of a lot of the most complex work, and so we need to be able to uh, close the esplanade so that we can do that work. 
And so you can see that picture here uh, in the summer of 2023, uh, the Esplanade closure throughout the park, but at the same time in 2023, uh, we flip and start the second phase of park construction. Uh, here we're able to open over 50% of East River Park during that year. Uh, and then the second phase of construction lasts from the spring of 2023 to late 2025, so that subsequent two and a half years. Uh, newly rebuilt portions of East River Park will be open from Houston Street to approximately East 10th Street, as well as the vast majority of the park areas in the south from Corlears Hook Bridge to Delancey Street. You can see that some Esplanade areas will remain closed in the newly opened areas for a little while as we finish those up. The other critical thing we want to make sure we emphasize, the flood protection will be complete. We will be able to address a coastal storm surge by the middle of 2023, by hurricane season 2023. That's because we have some areas that are finished and some areas that have been closed. The first thing we're going to do is put the flood protection in place. You can see the picture in 2024. We've been able to open more of the Esplanade in areas where the park is completed. By the summer of 2025, most of the Esplanade uh, has been reopened, and then the park itself will be fully completed by the end of 2025 uh, at that conclusion stage. But again, the flood protection in place by the middle of 2023. Uh, this is a picture uh, which is a, a sort of more detail on the multi-phase plan. Um, this, we'll post this online and make sure that uh, people can have access to it. Um, it refers to geographies of the park, uh, which we call reaches, and we'll have a key map along with that when people look at it online. But it's basically showing the same thing that I just described, which is three phases. Uh, the first phase where the areas between Corlears Hook and the amphitheater, between Houston and Delancey, and between East 10th Street and East 12th Street are open for the first two and a half year period. Um, while work goes on in the other areas. Then that flips and we've got the areas that I described which are open in the second phase. Uh, then as can be seen on the third uh, sort of line here, there's an esplanade closure uh, in the middle uh, so that we can get that work done. So that's the phasing plan for East River Park. Um, also wanted to note, uh, as uh, council members have referenced, there is another uh, phase to this project which is uh, the areas to the north of 14th Street. We've been working on a phasing plan for that as well and synced it up with the closure of East River Park as best we can. So what we have here is uh, about one and a half years construction on Astor Levy Park uh, up at 23rd, 24th Street happening first. Stuyvesant Cove takes approximately 24 months. So we would um, close Stuyvesant Cove Park for the reconstruction and building the flood wall uh, in the middle at the end of 2021 and leaving Murphy Brothers Park open as long as we can because that can also serve as an amenity uh, for folks that would otherwise be using East River Park. We've also been working on the uh, timing for Murphy Brothers Park construction, recognizing that it's used by Little League teams, and so we believe this timing at present uh, works so that there's just one season uh, that, that, that it's not available for Little League. And then for a brief design overview, I'll turn to Deputy Commissioner Cobb Conan. Thanks, Jamie. Um, improved access for from com the community into the park is one of the primary goals of this project. And what you see in front of you is an image of what East River Park would look like in the future, demonstrating two of the major access improvements to the park, both at Corlears Park Bridge, a bridge that needs to be reconstruction, re reconstructed, and its integration into the amphitheater, as well as the Delancey Street Bridge. These new access points will be universally accessible at grade access directly into the park, unlike the steep, narrow switchback entrances of the 1939 Robert Moses Park that East River Park is today. Included in this image, you also see a new playground and the provision of solar lights on a scale that New York City Parks has never done before. Jamie, if you go to the next one. One of the key things we heard from the community was to replace all the active recreation and to provide passive informal spaces within the park, which is reflected in the design. We're reconstructing all the program elements. Here you see tennis courts, basketball courts, multi-use fields, soccer and ba ball fields. We've also added new barbecue area in the southern part of the park. Moving north up to the 10th Street area, uh, we are replacing the existing program, as I mentioned, plus new modern park buildings 
and the sorely needed reconstruction of the playground at 10th Street. At each new at-grade entrance to the park, we're building a greeting and entrance lawn, followed by step downs and an embayment to look and touch the water. And not only are we ensuring that the recreational uses that the community values will continue to be part of the park and elevated out of the way of storms, we're also making sure that we are planting a diverse, resilient planting palette, unlike the plantings that predominate today. This project will introduce 52 different species of trees, including species that will grow faster to help provide shade sooner. These species will be layered in groves and sited with park uses and ecological richness in mind. As we move out of East River Park, this is a conceptual image of how the flyover bridge goes over the Con Ed buildings, solving the three-foot Con Edge pinpoint that has long been identified as key to making the Manhattan Greenway complete. Landing on the southern section, uh, the, sorry, landing into the northern section of the project, a flood wall will run between the Con Ed facility and the FDR, sheltering Murphy Brothers Playground, and then moving under and behind Stuyvesant Cove, effectively under the FDR, with a focus on making entrances into Stuyvesant Cove Park inviting and planting native plants. The flood protection runs back under the FDR and is integrated into Asser Levy Recreation Center and Playground for its tieback and completion of the flood protection compartment so that it is a standalone system. To make this project happen, we want to be able to, we want to be sure to be able to implement and maintain the flood protection. As such, we have several ULERP actions that are before you. The ULERP actions mainly consist of authorizations to allow the city to negotiate access easements adjacent to where we will be building flood protection structures. There is also a technical zoning amendment required for Stuyvesant Cove Park since it is not Map City Parkland and is subject to waterfront zoning. In considering how to implement this project, we've studied various project alternatives and examined the anticipated impacts. An impact we're really focused on and an impact that would be relevant regardless of how we approach this project is the partial closure of East River Park during construction. Here's what we're doing to mitigate. First of all, we're phasing the project, which means that significant portions of East River Park will remain open at all times, along with the timing of the second part of the project. And then secondly, we're undertaking a suite of neighborhood improvements to local recreational resources, including creating new turf fields, putting in solar lights to extend playing time, prioritizing keeping local youth leagues local, we're sports coating playgrounds, painting equipment and furnishings, and this work is already underway. We're planting 1,000 additional neighborhood trees in addition to the ones that are being planted as part of the project, 40 new rain gardens. We're creating new open space at LaGuardia and our Pier 42 project Upland. We're collaborating with partner agencies such as NYCHA where we'll be sprucing up their open spaces, and we're funding new recreational and maintenance staff. Um, this concludes our presentation. We encourage the public to look at our website where there is a lot of information on this project and thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for your testimony today. Do one of my colleagues have questions? I'm gonna let you ask yours first. Councilmember Rivera? Sure, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so can you tell us a little bit about how you came to go from plan three to plan four? Sure, S certainly, council member. So the, the design and construction of this protection system of this magnitude has never been built in this city before. So to ensure construction feasibility, efficiency, and achieve on-time delivery of the project, we performed a thorough and comprehensive constructability review of the original plan at about 40% design. Um, in the fall, we did that in the fall of 2018. That review determined that the flood wall plan near the East River Park was a significant risk to our ability to complete the project on schedule. 
After the review, we were able to avoid construction risk and the challenges that would have delayed this project. The improved plan reduces construction time so we can deliver flood protection one year earlier in time for 2023. It reduces truck traffic. It reduces overnight pile driving in front of the NYCHA developments by more than half and avoids massive complexities by not working near an active Con Ed transmission line. Furthermore, by eliminating the, the exposed flood wall, the updated design approach provides enhanced neighborhood connectivity and integration, waterfront access, quality open space, as well as passive and active rec recreational spaces that will improve the quality of life of the community and for generations to come. So I, I appreciate you mentioning specifically the, the fact of the pile driving through the night. Correct. Next to NYCHA, I think that's an important factor. I just, the, the FDR mentioned, I mean, most of us could care less about cars. We're trying to break the car culture here in New York City. Right. So was the FDR really a factor? We, we don't accept that. No, no, actually this was the disturbance to the NYCHA community. That was the, the driving factor. Um, they, the, the, if I might, the um, truck traffic, the uh, backup in traffic would have been a disturbance to the community. That's the only concern we had about the FDR and how it would disturb the community. So who was at the table when you came, when you're, you're doing the constructability review, you're deciding that the old plan had many variables in it that were, they were adverse impacts to the community. Who, who's at the table? Are there, there's engineers, there's architects, there's environmentalists. Can you give us an idea of who was there Absolutely. so we can know the sure. minds, the talent, the expertise? Sure. Sure, we had, we had, of course, in-house as well as consultant our architects and engineers. We also work very closely with our partners at Parks Department and others to review this, and of course, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. We were all at the table together making these decisions. What's the status of a study for the greening of the FDR Drive? Thanks, Council Member. Uh, I think the uh, Deputy Mayor for Operations uh, Office is going to respond to that. Uh, Manelli Deku with the Deputy Mayor's Office. Good afternoon. Do I have to be sworn in? You said swear in. Am I going to? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? And please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in response to uh, all council member questions? Yes. So thank you so much for bringing up the greening study. Um, so we have been um, looking into ways that we can um, progress these options, um, and we're really looking forward um, to working with the council members and working with the community to develop a, a plan or a study um, to assess greening options as well as um, improving sustainability and resiliency along the FDR drive. I think many of us, um, I just wanna bring up, you know, they closed Bronx River Parkway on some weekends during the summertime. I think many of us would be open to seeing the FDR drive closed every once in a while to really reclaim our roads and our streets. So I just wanna put that out there in addition to what I think is important, which is a greening. Uh, can you, I wanna talk a little bit about the dirt, um, if that's okay. Can you clarify the origins of the fill you will use to raise the park's elevation? I've heard different words. I've heard dirt, I've heard infill, and I've heard landfill. Which is correct and which local, state, and federal agencies are involved in monitoring the safety of this material and do you commit to a hazardous material mitigation plan that goes beyond the typical? Sure. Thanks, Council Member. So the, the correct term is fill, um, which is clean soil that is used to build up elevation and earthworks on construction sites throughout the city. Um, we use fill in uh, probably most uh, pr uh, parks projects, uh, uh, most projects in the city. Um, uh, it's very typical. Uh, we also, I think I noted before, uh, in the prior approach to delivering the project, would have needed a substantial amount of fill as well. Uh, in this case, we have the advantage that we're able to bring the fill material in by barge uh, into the park, which eliminates 
uh, roughly 50 truck trips, uh, trips eliminated for every barge that we're able to use. Um, use of the fill is heavy re heavily regulated at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, the uh, contractor that we'll have on this must comply with all required laws and regulations. Um, fill material that will be used for raising the park basically consists of sand, clay, and gravel and contains no contaminants. Uh, testing occurs uh, by our contractor at the source, so not after the fill arrives on the site. The testing occurs at the source, and that testing is heavily regulated by uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Chair, just two more questions. I know my, my colleagues also want to ask. Um, I want to ask about a couple stuff very quickly, hyper-locally. What is the status of plans uh, for a temporary site for the Lower East Side Ecology Center? And can you commit to moving the Seal Water Park sculptures nearby? So thank you, Council Member. So on the Lower, side, Lower East Side Ecology Center, um, yes, we're advancing plans to make sure that there's a place for them during construction. Uh, we anticipate that they'll be at Seward Park for their uh, programming, and we're working very hard to make sure that there's a place for the compost as well. We expect to have one for that as well. Um, on, the, on the seals, which was the second question that you asked, um, we're working with, directly with the artist to install seals at Pier 42, as well as salvage some of the bronze uh, turtles and crabs from um, East River Park, um, and we're, we're also talking to him about other salvage opportunities. And I just want to say thank you. I know we've been working very closely, the Parks Department, in looking at the, the permits and making sure that our leagues, our, our sports teams, our local schools have places to play. I, I'm glad that they'll be able to access the park and that there'll be alternative mitigation. So I want to thank your team because you've actually been uh, the most responsive agency throughout all of this. I, I want to ask if you are, and again, we are waiting for a final determination from a Netherlands-based firm on whether this approach is a good approach for the community, but if, if you've committed to it, if you think that this is the best approach, um, I, I'm just curious as to why eight to 10 feet? How did you come to that determination? We're looking at projections for floods in 100 years, in 150 years. If you're so committed to this, and again, we're waiting for an independent panel, a, a, a review, why not raise it even higher? Sure. Um, I think I'll start and then ask, pass along to Director Bavishi. So um, the, uh, at the outset, in the early stages of planning for the project, um, we had modeling done, um, we're sort of reliant on the New York City panel uh, on climate change projections for what the future major storm building in sea level rise looks like uh, and what elevation that comes to. So the eight feet uh, increase in elevation on average uh, is based on that, is based on the future projection that was produced by the New York City panel on climate change. So the New York City panel on climate change, um, I just want to mention that we're really fortunate to have this panel because um, no other city uh, has a panel like this. No other city in the country has a panel like this. Um, and some of the most accomplished science, climate scientists uh, belong to this panel. So we're really getting the best scientific advice um, in the country, if not the world, um, as we're designing these projects. Um, the New York City panel on climate change projects that sea level rise will, uh, sea levels will rise at least 22 inches by 2100. Um, and more like, uh, and more likely as much as, uh, 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 sorry, let me start that again. The NPCC, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, projects that sea levels will rise at least 22 inches by 2100 and more likely as much as 50 inches. Um, for comparison, this project is using 58 inches uh, combined with storm surge as a design condition. So we're, we're being very conservative in how much sea level rise we're accounting for to account for the worst case scenario. Um, but it's also important to remember that we are uh, uh, facing a moving target. Climate change is a dynamic threat. Um, and uh, for this reason, we have designed the project to be adaptable um, with a foundation that can accommodate the addition of two more feet of protect protection in future decades. And we're monitoring the projections and the science very closely. Thank you. I, I realize, I know that we as humans are probably the biggest variable in climate change, so we all have to do better. Um, I don't see NYCHA here. My last question before I want to give my colleagues clearly an opportunity is about there is a lot of resiliency work going on on the NYCHA campuses immediately adjacent to ESCR. 
And I want to know whether these projects conflict or, or conflict or complement each other. Um, is ESCR a greater form of protection to NYCHA residents than the FEMA work? Does anyone have that information here? So our um, approach to resiliency is multi-layered in, uh, in its nature. We are strengthening our defenses on multiple levels from the coastline itself, like with the ESCR project, to buildings um, and, uh, and even beyond, hardening infrastructure and strengthening social cohesion in neighborhoods. Um, the NYCHA work is building and campus specific. So it does not address all the buildings in the floodplain, but rather the specific uh, buildings where that work is happening. While the ESCR project protects the entire neighborhood. Um, additionally, the ESCR project, as I mentioned before, is built, being built to a very protective standard, but having redundancy in the system will provide another layer of defense for the vulnerable residents in this area. The two projects, or the multiple projects, I should say, the work that is happening on NYCHA campuses as well as ESCR are absolutely complementary. Thank you, Chair Adams, for the time. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Um, just following up on those questions, uh, going to the project area two in Stuyvesant Cole Park. Um, if, a, if a category five hurricane were to hit Manhattan directly and the worst, the worst case scenario of sea level rise happens there, are the walls that are being constructed there tall enough to protect Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village from flooding? Um, so the, uh, I'll say um, the uh, flood protection uh, throughout the project is geared towards the same elevation. So the elevation that was described by Director Bivishi, which um, is for a conservative projection with sea level rise and the 100-year flood. And throughout the project, we have the, the same design. For so for 100 years, are those walls tall enough to protect Stein's and Tana Peter Cooper Village from flooding? Um, so the, what we've designed to is the worst case scenario for the 100 year flood in the 2050s with the ability to increase it structurally by two feet, which takes you up to the worst case scenario in the early 2100s. Um, and so it's, 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 it's aimed at protecting uh, uh, that area for until 2050 with the ability to add two more feet to accommodate future uh, a potential future need to increase the size of the wall? Yes, but I do just want to clarify that um, it's a, the sort of uh, storm events are somewhat more dynamic um, so that it's not that you sort of always build just to the 100 year flood, right? So um, you can have an 80 year flood, you can have a 90 year flood. So it's not exact like that, but because of the prescriptions that we get from FEMA, we build to the future projected 100 year flood and that's what this is built to. I was hoping for a yes. <laughs> do you want, uh, you want to ask the question? To be very clear about what I was. Do, do you want to ask the question again? And uh, <laughs> um, what what is the criteria used to close the floodgates of the wall? And who? What? And what agency is responsible for for doing that? Right. So, uh, once constructed, the um, flood protection structures outside of the park area will be operated and maintained by the Department of Transportation. Um, there is a set of protocols uh, led by New York City Emergency Management um, by which we look at projections of what's coming and decisions are made based on that uh, when to close those flood protection structures. Okay. And it, what happens if there's another storm in the meantime while construction is taking place? Well, we, so um, our contractors are required to and will uh, take all measures that they can to make sure that um, equipment can be tied down um, or removed, uh, that materials are not exposed and so on. That's all very heavily regulated. Um, if, the, uh, if an event of some significance occurs, it would disrupt uh, construction for that period of time, which is why we're trying to get this built uh, as quickly as we can. Okay. Um, and, and, but, but noting that, uh, in, and at least in the project here I am, um, Esther Levy Playground and Stuyvesant Cove will still be left, at least with a partial or complete uh, lack of flood protection. So what, what's the resiliency plan for those parks that will be still flooded? Right, so. Or able to be flooded? Sure, council member. So, um, so the physical site constraints, such as those in Stuyvesant Cove Park, are too narrow for a design that would raise the whole park uh, and the paths along the waterfront. Um, so the accessibility into that park would be too steep uh, if the park were raised. Um, however, the design for Stuyvesant Cove Park and Astor Levy will incorporate resilient landscaping, including use of more native salt-tolerant species that better withstand 
windy and maritime conditions and can bounce back quickly from, from flooding. Do you have an estimation on how long it would take to reconstitute those parks if after a flood? Uh, we don't have an exact estimation. The playground is mostly hardscape, so once the cleaning up is done, which can be done operationally very quickly, it should be uh, bounced right back. There may be some more significant restorations required for Stuyvesant Cove, but we would expect that could happen very quickly. I don't know, uh, Commissioner Silver, you wanted to comment further on that. Commissioner, you answered it exactly correct. We're rebuilding Esther Levy with a harder scape uh, so that it can recover a lot more quickly. Uh, there will be a, a wall to protect the recreation center, but the playground itself will be built to be much more resilient and harder so we can recover. And, and can I just follow up on that question? The community board has asked for the wall to be considered on the 25th Street side rather than intersecting into the park, so thereby protecting the whole park. Uh, can you tell us if any update on the reasoning for doing it through the park rather than surrounding the whole park? I think there's representatives on the community board here as well. Um, thank you. Yes, we've we've um, talked about it with the community board on sev several occasions um, and explained the trade-offs and happy to come back and, and describe them some more as well. Um, as uh, Commissioner Silver mentioned, we we have uh, this at this location we have a wall. Um, and so around the Astor Levy Rec Center, um, which is consistent with the gate, uh, gates that are there now. Um, we've worked very hard to make sure that um, access through what used to be Astor Levy Place is maintained. That's about, I think, 80 feet wide, that access way. And then the park itself, um, there were a number of considerations that included um, trees, utilities, um, and also sight lines that um, in, in uh, weighing those considerations that we thought the best thing to do was to tie into the VA wall. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing to what Commissioner Silver mentioned, which is also that Astor Levy Playground is behind the FDR, and so we don't foresee the same kind of potential storm impacts that you would directly on the waterfront. Okay. Um, I, stating that, because the community board, I think, I think also the folks at Waterside Plaza have raised a concern that you are, for, and for the folks at Waterside, that's the, I think the primary playground, that you are leaving that part vulnerable to a, uh, a storm, a flooding, and potentially loss of space at a time where you're doing a resiliency plan and protecting a, po a portion of the park. What is the cost of rebuilding that park if it was flooded? The playground, if, you, if it got flooded, would there be a, a, a cost to having to do any repairs or restoration? We don't believe so because it is a hard surface and the way we mount in the play equipment, our expectation is that the mounting will hold. And so it, it, we don't expect to see, you don't know the impact or velocity of the storm surge, but it is gonna be a hardscape with minimal elements that could be destroyed. So our expectation, it can bounce back relatively quickly. Okay, moving to another park, uh, Murphy Brothers uh, Playground. It's a it's, um, playground uh, sort of on Avenue C, um, playground, ballparks, uh, basketball playground. Um, there's going to be an effort to rebuild that. It's, it's a two, well, one, one predominant question. Uh, the, the Little League uses that as a playground. I think they're probably one of the most predominant users of that park. Is there... Um, there's, I, as I understand it, there's going to be a hookup to put a comfort station in there, but not a comfort station put in there. Can you give us any update on whether there is a decision made to install a comfort station at that park, which well, is right used now, by a lot of families in the neighborhood? Right now, the comfort station is being designed so it could be included into this project, but the funding is, is still to be finalized. So that's a still a maybe? Is that fair? Still a maybe, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll get you there. Um, on the timeline for the flyover bridge, uh, the kind of pinch point, which is something that my folks uh, have, have asked for, um, w why can't we have that at the same time construction is occurring on this? Why, why wait till the project's done to put that in place? And um, how will, uh, and why, why, why can't it begin prior to 2023? Thanks, Council Member. Um, we do have DOT here, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll try to just give the answer and we can call them up. Um, uh, basically, the bridge has to be designed. Um, so we're almost at the end of design here for the ESCR project. Um, DOT is moving to initiate design as quickly as they can. Um, with Why not do design? Why not do design now? As it, that, that's what they're doing. They're, they're getting started with design as soon as they can. Um, with the new schedule that we described here, 
we should be finishing that, uh, and we are building the foundations or the footings for that bridge as part of the ESCR project. So we should be finishing that around the midpoint, around early 2023, and then DOT is looking at how they can deliver the bridge immediately after that. So and how, when do you think the bridge goes on line? Th they've given us a schedule of two years for construction. So they're looking at delivering it immediately after we've finished uh, that first phase, which means that you would see it completed prior actually to the end of the ESCR project. Sorry, but I didn't know if it did. did I hear like a logistical reason why it can't happen now? It just seems like the design was taken for, was taken, was delayed. Would, you want to ask DOT to come up and uh, provide some comments? Will I have to do this? Okay. Please raise your right hand and state your name. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I, Jennifer Santainis. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answer to all council member questions? I do. So first, Deputy Commissioner, um, Jamie Torres Springer did give you know just the basic update and just to clarify some of the delays or in terms of installing and moving forward with construction of the flyover bridge um, it's due to coordination of utilities um, it's a very complicated uh, process we are working on trying to expedite construction as well and firming up our design details at the moment yeah, I just, I mean, the only comment I'll have is if it's not part of this ULERP, mm -hmm. it's a commitment, not a not a not a part of this design process. So it's we're left to we're left with the promise, I think, rather than something that's part of this whole rezoning. Absolutely, Council Member. We are working very closely with DDC to try to ensure that you know we can expedite the process as, as quickly as possible. Uh I just want to also note, Council Member, the, the funds are fully in the budget for the flyover bridge, and it is a hard commitment by the administration that it will be built. Okay. Design is being initiated uh, as quickly I as possible. I hope the next administration will build it. Um, the, uh, my last question is, this is a concern that came up really to Stives and Cove Park, um, that the bike paths is going to be located west of the uh, west of the wall, so there'll be a wall, park on one side, bike lane on the other side. Um, is there a reason why the bike paths on the west side versus kind of inside of it? The, the concern that one had raised is that that sort of activity of running and biking sort of helps contribute to safety and activity with, around the park. It's one of the uses in, in a sense of the park. And that's so for folks who walk down there, it can, it can feel unsafe, particularly if you wall in, if you have a wall, I know it's be open, but a wall and, and in addition, you have the, some of the prime activity and uses on the other side um, that this would be contribute to sort of bifurcating the park rather than keeping it whole. Thanks, Council Member. So the, the basis for that design decision is how tight things are there by the FDR, where we can't move the flood wall any closer to the FDR and safely build it. Um, because of the disruption uh, structurally both to the structures of the FDR and also the con ed lines that are running through there. So um, that's, that's, so what you, you end up doing is putting the bike path, uh, as you say, on the inland side. However, um, we've showed some renderings at the Public Design Commission and within the community, and we're happy to um, uh, bring those out as well, um, just to show that, first of all, uh, the bike path is not at the bottom of the wall, it's likely to be elevated, so th there will be some visibility, um, and also we're looking visibility at, uh, over, over the, the wall. Protection. Yes, and also we're looking at some treatments um, f for for the wall. So there are ways of treating it so that it is it is more comfortable and addressing some of the issues that you described. Though, though I'm just going to finish here because uh, I know some more questions and a lot of folks who want to testify. The I can, it just as we move forward on this, I just ask that we can, if there is a concern around safety and security, we can look at in the new design of it, ways to either, whether it's through lighting or other things, whether we need security cameras, whatever might be that to help contribute to a sense of safety and connectivity, that we can look at some of those elements to um, make sure that uh, folks do, do, who do want to use there and walk down there, and it's a little, you know, it's a little, just a little bit separate from the neighborhood, will feel uh, a sense of comfort. Absolutely, and we'll ask DOT to get back to you in more detail on that, Council Okay, Member. thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Powers. We'll hear from Council Members Chin, Barron, and Miller in that order. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, can Parks Department or, or the Commissioner uh, give us a timeline of the deconstruction of the LaGuardia bathhouse and turn that into uh, open green space? How is that coming along? Uh, thank you. A lot of noise. Sorry? A lot, <laughs> a lot of noise happening over there. <laughs> Right, so um, the, the mayor committed $10 million to help um, create a new open space there, which involves demolishing the bathhouse, which is substantially completed. They're working now in the foundational areas of the utilities underground to complete that. Um, Parks Department will come in afterwards to put in a synthetic turf lawn, um, which will be for people to use and sit on. It's a, gonna be a passive space, um, and in concert with that, our operations folks are out there now and will be doing more work in the surrounding park to make it an integrated whole uh, little flower playground. Are, are you meeting with the community board and the local resident there to also see how you know, their comments and concern about the design or, or the use that they would like to see? Um, yes, absolutely. We've been both at the community board um, as well as the tenant association. And, continue, and happy to continue those conversations. Okay, my second question is what is the status of the request uh, to EDC for free ferry service to Governor's Island? They got a lot of ball fields out there, it's a beautiful park out there. Um, any feedback on that that you heard? Um, so yes, we're working with our partners. I believe EDC is here if you have further questions on it. Uh, on the ferry service, as Jamie mentioned, we'll have ferry service continuing from uh, both East River Park and Stuyvesant Cove during, during the project. Um, we've been meeting with Governor's Island on you know, the offering of their spaces, which are available, including the ball fields. Um, as we mentioned earlier as well, um, we have been focusing on trying to keep as many local leagues local, um, as well as the phasing of the park also means that um, we'll have more fields available. So we're working on concert on both of those fronts. Well, definitely extending the, the Low East Side route uh, to Governor's Island will make it, you know, we'll have more people able to access Governor's Island. Because right now, in order for them to go, they got to take the M15 bus, right, to the last stop, and then take the ferry. So if you got a ferry that's right near, right in the Low East Side, that makes it so much easier. Thank you. Thank you. There, there, is, there is service to Governor's Island, um, but I'm not an expert on it, and, and EDC could address it. Well, yeah, finish. we want the administration to really consider, because the, the ferry to Governor's Island, it is free in the morning, so you could, EDC, you could consider that um, in the Lower East Side. It will allow more people to take advantage of the beautiful ball fields and, and parks out there. Uh, my last question is that I know part of the ULER uh, in Project Area 1, you're talking about uh, you have to acquisition of easement with Gouverneur Garden Cooperative, East River Housing Cooperative, Nature Reach, uh, Reaches, Reese Houses and Baruch Houses. How are those uh, discussions going with the residents? Uh, thank you, Council Member, and I, I can speak to that. So we've had a number of productive um, discussions so far with those, um, the property um, owners and and and, um, and the co-op boards, um, and I think you know we're really listening to their concerns and just really trying to develop a path forward. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that um, that we're going to get there, and you know that the Euler approval is just the beginning um, of those negotiations. Well, I urge you to continue um, to meet with them because. I mean, it started because residents reached out and said that they weren't, you know, getting responses. So we got to make sure that that they are taken care of. Yeah, and thank you to your um, your staff as well that has been, you know, attending these meetings with us as well, um, and and we'll continue to to have these meetings and ongoing conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming and presenting this information. And you can see by the audience that this is a very popular, important topic, and we look forward to hearing what the audience has to say. When you talked about uh, one of the panel members, I'm not quite sure, who talked about the fact that the fill material will be transported by barge, and that barge would save or would be the equivalent of 10 trucks. So my question is, what's the fuel that's being used for these barges? Thank you, Councilmember. I, I, I don't have that information specifically, but I, we can get back to you on that. 
you don't have it. Well, then how do we know that there's an advantage if you don't have the information so that we can make a comparison to say, oh, this is good. It's coming by barge, not by truck. How can we think that this is an advantage if you can't tell us that? Sure. Thank you, Council Member. Yes, I, I think from, from our perspective, the advantage really is that the community will not be disturbed by trucks one after the other during the night. This will save that disturbance. That's great, but what's the impact of the fuel that's being used if we compare the fuel of a barge to the fuel of the truck? Yes. I think that that has to be a consideration Certainly. in addition to considering what noise factor sure. might be. So I think that's very important, and as we find out what that fuel is, we can get an assessment as to what is the impact of that fuel, how many barges do we anticipate will be needed for the duration or particularly on a daily basis what we anticipate to be the number of barges. And also um, the pollution that might be emitted by the fuel used by the barge, what's its impact on the environment, on the air, and of course on the water because the fuel, uh, the release into the water, we need to evaluate that as well. We talked about um, a barge again, what's the impact of the barge as you do your environmental study on the animal life? Whatever that fuel is that's being used for the barge, what's that impact on the animal life uh, in that, in that uh, coastal area? You also mentioned the bike lane and you talked about the fact that you were working, when you talked about the bikes, you referenced Con Ed. So Con Ed, have you been working with Con Ed and what's their role going to be in terms of making sure that there's no disruption for cable service to those persons whose uh, service is delivered by the um, equipment in that area? Yes, uh, thank you, Council Member. That, that, the coordination with utilities, including Con Ed, is a very important part of all the work that we do uh, as a Department of Design and Construction, no less in this situation. We've been working very closely with Con Ed um, to basically design this project together uh, and intend to use a mechanism that was used to facilitate um, the, the, uh, the work on utilities uh, in Lower Manhattan uh, called joint bidding so that we're able to manage all the work together uh, and we don't anticipate that there will be uh, any significant issues. Of course, we have uh, community construction liaisons and a real presence during the project so that uh, if there's ever an outage for some reason, we provide uh, the typical 72 hours advance notice uh, and then confirm within 24 hours. So we'll certainly be doing all of that as will the utilities. So that's for planned interruptions. What is your plan that you have for unexpected uh, disruption due to construction error or a break in the cable or? Right, well, so um, we do have a system set up with the utilities where uh, in the event that there is uh, an incident such as the one that you occur, the utilities are immediately deployed to the scene uh, and they bring back service as quickly as possible. That's uh, an unfortunate thing that, that does happen sometimes during construction in the city, but we're able to deal with it very quickly. And I believe that in part of your renderings, you indicate that there would be solar panels along parts of the uh, park. Who, what will be the benefit, who will benefit, or what will that energy be used for? Uh, the energy generated It was generated mentioned for solar lighting. Solar lighting, solar, oh, solar lighting. lighting. And so it's the reduction of the infrastructure underground that you have to provide. So we're looking at solar lighting at a much larger scale that we've done in other parks. Okay, uh, I think those are my questions. If I have more, perhaps we'll have a second round. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to the panel and to the members of the audience and public. So this is obviously a, a, a large, colossal project, first time that we're un undertaking a resiliency project of this magnitude in the city here. Um, what, what, how, is imp how important is this as a template for future resiliency projects That's a very good point. Th throughout the city? Is, is a lot of the emphasis that we see beyond, are we seeing beyond the Lower East Side and the East Side access now? 
Thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, absolutely, we are learning a lot from this uh, coastal protection project and we'll be able to apply the lessons to other resiliency projects that we are constructing citywide. In particular, I think we're learning about the uh, incredible importance of community engagement and, um, uh, and how that process um, uh, must in, impact the, the design and construction of how we engage these projects. Um, we, are, we have an opportunity to transform the waterfront and build flood protection into the, our waterfront, um, and the community must be a part of that. Um, secondly, we're learning the importance of uh, agency coordination. Um, th these incredibly complex projects require partnerships between numerous city agencies, but also with other partners outside of the city. Um, and uh, we have learned a lot about how to make that as efficient as possible, and we'll be applying that to other projects. Let me so, thank you. I just want to add thank you for your question. Uh, New York City is a coastal city. There's over 525 miles of coastline within the city, and over 155 miles are within parks of that 525. So the lessons learned here are absolutely key as we move into the century, knowing that climate change is a reality. These lessons learned are critical as we start to rebuild our parks citywide, but look at the over 500 miles of coast. And so the city is committed to a 20 billion plan to look at how we can better protect ourselves. So this project is vitally important for the lessons learned and how we address parks in the future and other assets in the city. Uh, obviously, um representing Southeast Queens with, with our high water tables and our consistent flood problems that we've had for, for generations already is, is very important. And so as we build this out, we want to make sure that we're looking beyond this project and looking at best practices. And certainly we want, I want to hear from the community and, and what that engagement looks like as, as we move forward, particularly a, a project of this magnitude there are beyond even this particular project, there should be other community benefits that we're looking at, and, and I'm, I'm certainly interested in hearing from the community on what those uh, benefits are um, in terms of uh, uh, job development and, and, uh, um, and uh, local benefits to the community. Certainly want, want, to, want to talk about that when, when you see a project of this magnitude happen. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about um, the impact on uh, a project of this magnitude on the, the budget and the resources of parks in DDC. Um, uh, we're going to see other parks and other projects take a, a back seat to this project here. Thank you for your question. As you know, this administration is committed toward equity, and we've proven that through a lot of our projects, both the Community Parks Initiative, Anchor Parks, and how we actually invest and care for all of our parks. This park would be no different. We want to make sure that as we care for this park, that all parks throughout the city uh, are maintained, kept safe to the same level throughout the entire city. And that commitment will continue uh, as East River Park is developed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Barron, did you want uh, another? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel for your time this afternoon. We know that this has been quite a process and will continue to be quite a process, so thank you for your efforts, and you are excused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna call up the next panel. Dan Wiley, in behalf of Council Member Nydia Velasquez, Senator Brian Cavanaugh, and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Go ahead. You may begin. Thank you very much, Chair Adams and the, your wonderful colleagues. I am Gail Brewer. I am the Borough President of Manhattan, and I'm here to testify on the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, a project that everybody in the room is very familiar with on the East River Park. Um, needless to say, I've spent a great deal of time on this topic. 
Uh, I want to thank the community because you came out for our hearing as part of the ULIP process on July 17, 2019, and you have been wonderfully engaging ever since. And I think when the city says it's important to have community engagement, you have shown that it is done correctly, and I thank you. So we all know that after Hurricane Sandy, uh, it is really important to have investment into flood resiliency for the safety and the longevity of residents, particularly here in community boards three and six, but everywhere in the city where there is waterfront. And that's why I support the vision of a coastal resiliency plan, but I want the project to be done right the first time. The East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, I think has failed in some of this regard, first time. Previous public engagement that was centered on quote unquote design alternative three, which we're all familiar with, was suddenly replaced with the current proposal design alternative four, or the quote unquote preferred alternative, unquote. And I think in this case, and the city has heard this many times, it did regard three years of constant community input to put forward a plan that is not at all considered preferred by the community, or at least by many, many, many members of the community, and there is a diverse of opinion. So while we must take action on resiliency, Alternative four needs major improvements. And that's why I want to thank Council Member Carlina Rivera. The two of us hired an outside expert, as you know, to review the project. And I have to say, just so you know, I know you're waiting for it, but it will be available on Monday. And I say that because the company and the individual working on it really wants to do it correctly. So it will be available before there is a vote. Um, yesterday, as you know, the city announced that the city, the agencies, and the mayor will be adhering to phase construction, something that everybody in this room wanted, and which would begin immediately and stretch the construction timeline into 2025. I certainly support the phasing. We all call for it. But I strongly encourage the city to defer the beginning of construction until reviewing the report from the independent consultant in its entirety as well as taking into consideration any recommendations. In addition, construction should not begin until the phasing schedule and a plan for community and youth sports leagues access to recreational and green space is conveyed and approved by everyone in the community. The releasing of these documents is vital for more transparency and trust between the city and residents. I also want the city to release to the public any engineering or environmental studies that underlie the conclusions made by the final environmental impact statement, FEIS, to prove that there would be little or no adverse impact by the project and its construction and air quality, noise, traffic, and more, and we know these are main issues. I have testified on this topic at least three times, and I feel like I am living this project. But I want to be very clear that we still need more information. For instance, the FEIS published on September 14th continues to assert with language that states that number four, design alternative four, is unlikely to result in significant adverse effects to natural resources. I don't believe that. It fails to explain how the destruction of 991 mature trees the replacement of the existing park with fill and the rising, raising of the park eight to nine feet could fail to have an adverse impact on the environment. And I know you've heard testimony on this and we understand the trees are failing due to the salt water, but we need more information. While the city has taken steps to address construction phasing, there are still unanswered questions and more outreach necessary. There has still been no action taken by the city to establish the requested community task force, number one. Number two, the issues of the fireboat house and the Lower East Side Ecology Center and its composting program remain unaddressed. Yes, we heard earlier composting may be okay, but I really want the firehouse newly done however Christine wants to be part of the program. Shh, shh, quiet. Con Edison still has not conducted appropriate outreach to NYCHA residents. Interim flood protection measures have yet to be promised despite the lack of protection to the area during the years of construction. And there are more issues that you heard by the wonderful questions asked by the council members. So with all of these questions still in the open and environmental studies in hiding, I have to say these alert for the 
ESCR does not constitute a thorough and transparent public review. So I support and urge the city to invest in flood protection. I also ask that the agencies respect the community approval process, which I think they have learned this community is involved. And this community needs the information that the public truly needs to make an informed decision about the future of their neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borough President. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, and I have the great privilege of testifying on behalf of a whole cadre of state officials. Uh, I offer this testimony on behalf of uh, Senator Brad Hoyleman and Assembly Members Harvey Epstein and uh, Yuli New. And like the Borough President, we've had several opportunities to testify on the topic, and I drew the uh, short straw today to be uh, here in person to deliver it to you, but I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so good afternoon to the chair and to the members of the committee and to our three uh, local uh, council members. It's great to see you sitting in today um, uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, you do have written copies of the testimony. I think I will skip some of the details for the in the interest of time and because I know a lot of folks here who want to speak. Um, but let me begin our testimony today by commending the efforts of our local city officials, uh, the borough president, uh, our congress member who you'll hear testimony on behalf of shortly, and especially your th uh, city council colleagues, Carlina Rivera, Margaret Chin, and Keith Powers on this important issue. Uh, we've collaborated very closely with them and they've shown great leadership in ensuring that the community has been engaged about this very complicated uh, project uh, and the issues that it raises. Um, Resiliency improvements are particularly uh, crucial in our local community because of the undeniable catastrophic impact of uh, Superstorm Sandy and the flooding in our districts. Uh, as you all well know, homes were flooded, neighborhoods were offline for days, and elderly and disabled residents were trapped in their apartments without ready access to food and water. Medical facilities were without power, and first responders had difficulty accessing uh, those requiring immediate help. Uh, storm surges of this magnitude were previously unimaginable in our, our thriving and densely populated city. Um, so we applaud the city and uh, the state uh, and others who are taking decisive action in response uh, to the urgent risks of extreme weather driven by the global uh, climate change uh, crisis. And we're also grateful in this context in particular for our congressional representatives, uh, Karen Maloney and Nadia Velasquez, who, for allocating necessary funds uh, to help pay for essential resiliency work in this community. Um, we'd also, I'll, I'll join uh, the borough president acknowledging the positive uh, decision the city made uh, to add phasing to this. Uh, from the day this was announced, we had said on behalf of many in the community that there needed to be some way to phase this so that parts of the park would be available throughout the project. Uh, so we're happy to see that they've responded uh, to that feedback. Uh, but notwithstanding that change and the continuing need uh, for storm resiliency in our districts, we have serious concerns about the sudden transformation of the SCR proposal from a plan that incorporated over four years of community input to a new proposal unilaterally promulgated by the city in December 2018. Uh, after years of working with the community on the previous plan, this unexpected change raises numerous questions about the process by which the city selected this new proposal and its process for gathering and incorporating public uh, input. Uh, given that it's a $1.45 billion uh, project, uh, it's import the importance of its goals and uh, the extensive impacts it'll have on our community, especially years of diminished use of an essential pu public parkland, uh, we want to ensure that the project's design and construction reflect our community's needs uh, and that the city is held accountable to its promises as we move forward, uh, making uh, the east side resilient. And I know that's something that all of the local council members share. So to enumerate our most pressing concerns. First, even with the phased plan announced yesterday, uh, regarding which we're seeking additional details, the project will result in a serious years-long reduction in access to parkland and recreation space that is essential for residents of our community. The city's made general commitments to providing enhancements to existing spaces and other alternative recreational opportunities that would be available during construction, but has failed to provide a coherent explanation of what that will be. Uh, it is essential that the, this mitigation of the loss of parkland be clearly publicly presented and reviewed before this project is approved. Second, uh, concerns related to the construction itself must be mitigated. The project could potentially stir up hazardous materials left over from the manufactured gas plants in the area, and construction noise could disrupt quality of life. 
Furthermore, the immense quantity of likely contaminated soil that would be excavated over the course of construction uh, could lead to air quality issues, creating health impacts for the community. The city must put forth a detailed soil management plan to show how it will address these serious concerns, especially in light of the fact that the rate of child asthma emergency department visits in the uh, community district overlapping with Project Area 1 is well over the citywide average. In addition uh, to the soil being excavated, the community must be assured that the sand being used uh, for infill to raise the park is of high quality and free from contaminants. Uh, the proposed project would also destroy much of the existing ecology of the area, as has been discussed, including the trees, uh, all of which are uh, planned to be cut down, uh, insect habitats, and tidal wetlands. It poses a risk to the well-being of certain species of fish in the area, such as herring and striped bass. In addition, uh, there must be a plan developed and implemented to pr uh, protect the amphitheater, as well as any existing art in the park that uh, will be impacted by construction. And I'll get to the... Uh, Lower East Side Ecology Center headquarters in a minute. Um, third, the timeline must uh, for phase construction now projected to take five years must be enforced through contractual uh, obligations and fines if necessary for contractors who do not deliver the project on time or who do not comply with promises made by city to the community. Um, fourth, since you know, uh, since we know this project will take at least five years to complete, during which time another catastrophic uh, storm could occur, a comprehensive plan for interim flood protection must be fully developed and provided to the community. I understand there was testimony uh, here today that the resiliency uh, aspects of this would be in place in three years rather than five years, but the point still stands. Uh, the plan must include an explanation of how construction could potentially impact the neighborhood during such a storm. Uh, unfortunately, although we wrote to the mayor, to Mayor de Blasio, requesting such a contingency plan on July 3rd, uh, 2019, we received a response without specific proposals uh, that merely touts the protections ECR, ESCR will provide upon completion. Again, with a, report, with a reported uh, multi-year time frame, uh, we need more information. Fifth. Any plan for ESCR must take into account the recommendations of the expert firm, uh, Del Taris, retained by uh, Borough President uh, Gail Brewer and Council Member Rivera, which I'm very happy to hear will be available on Monday, uh, in order to evaluate the ESCR proposals, uh, particularly uh, Design Alternative 3, the previous proposal, and Design Alternative 4, the current proposal. As uh, Community Board 3 noted its, in its resolution on ESCR, community uh, members have sought the creation of an expert panel to study additional perspectives, uh, options, uh, including decking over the FDR, the construction of a barrier to protect NYCHA residents on lower floors, and phasing uh, plans for construction that ensures timely completion of any project while mitigating the amount of time the public, is, uh, the public space is taken out of service. Six, the costs and community impacts of ESCR project demand that the project be approached with prudence, ensuring that it can proceed without threat of legal challenges. Based on our conversations with council uh, and our respective houses of the legislature, uh, it is our belief that a failure by the city to seek parkland alienation legislation leaves the city vulnerable to a lawsuit that could delay implementation of flood protections and the overall plan. Uh, we've discussed this ex extensively in various uh, uh, forums. Uh, so I'll, uh, we, but we restate it strongly today. To avoid delays that a lawsuit would pose, the city should seek the state legislature's approval for the project in a form of parkland alienation bill, which is typically sought by municipalities wishing to convey, sell, or lease parkland or discontinue its use as a park, either temporarily or permanently. Uh, seventh, the city has not adequately shown how the preferred alternative will address the underground streams that run underneath parts of Project Area 1 uh, between 4th Street and 10th Street uh, from the coastline to, Avenue, to 1st Avenue that com complicate drainage during storm surges. The community needs answers from the city as to how these streams will be factored into a uh, drainage pan. Finally, any project uh, that would interrupt the day-to-day -day use of the park must mitigate disruptions to the daily operations of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. The 20-plus year steward of our communities and the city's ecology uh, is a nonprofit organization located in the heart of, the, of East River Park. This has also been discussed, but uh, you know, a critical point for all of us. Um, so uh, just to sum up, uh, since the beginning of this year's long process, we've called on the city and every agency to pro e approach ESCR with a critical eye geared toward protecting the East River Park, our constituents know and love, while providing essential resiliency protections for the community. We're here to ask you as our uh, council colleagues to join uh, your local council members uh, in, and us in that effort. Understandably, there's enormous distrust of the city when it comes to this plan, especially considering the sudden huge change without community input, little transparency, and seemingly not one person uh, in charge of the project. 
Uh, there's a golden opportunity here to not only bring our community together around a shared goal of flood protection, but also create enhanced green spaces in a park that will serve the needs of our community for many years to come. We again commend the city for altering its plan to include phase construction, and we urge the city to continue working with residents and uh, to make this project uh, work for everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Dan Wiley. I'm here on behalf of Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez. Thank you for allowing me to present my testimony on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. ESCR project is a huge undertaking and we have one shot to get, uh, one shot to get it right for the long term. As we know, many residents of the Lower East Side still have fresh memory of the catastrophic impact of Superstorm Sandy and the flooding in our neighborhoods, as we all know. Uh, I also wanted to point out that other neighborhoods in the Congresswoman's District, such as Red Hook, were also uh, greatly impacted. And I just want to point out for everyone here that if you look at what investment is going on for flood protection in the peninsula of Red Hook, which has a if you include Red Hook East and West together, would have one of the largest housing developments in the city. Uh, it's really a drop in the bucket compared to what we're investing here. So I just wanted people to have that perspective. Uh, as public servants, we have a primary role to promote public health, safety, and welfare of the communities we represent. We have in front of us this once-in-a-lifetime op time opportunity to protect our community against future floods and sea level rise. We must get this right and ensure that stakeholders' concerns are engaged and carefully evaluated. While the need for resiliency is undeniable, the city must not proceed without addressing all the concerns that have been re repeatedly laid out by the community. As designed, residents and activists have expressed concerns with parts of the plan, such as the timeline, the lack of real community input on alternative ideas, the lack of independent vetting, and the impact of construction and access to public recreation. Now, elected officials, myself included, have repeatedly asked the city to take into full consideration the range of concerns. Uh, and I'm pleased that Councilwoman uh, Rivera and Borough, uh, Borough Pre Manhattan Borough President Brewer have this independent evaluator with global experience on flood protection and resiliency projects and I eagerly await the results and analysis of this report. Uh, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project will completely change the future of the East River Park uh, and the lives of thousands of residents who live along the waterfront. The development must be based on verified data and science and reflect the input and collaboration of our diverse community. We, we must explore best practices to mitigate and protect residents from future flooding. That should include uh, creating, as um, Borough President uh, G Brewer pointed out, a community task force. I think a, pr a project uh, of this uh, scope and length will require ongoing uh, reciprocity with the community and the vast uh, diversity in the community. I am pleased to see yesterday's announcement by the mayor of a phased approach to keep uh, nearly half of the park accessible through the construction process to, con uh, to complete the protections by the federal deadline. Additionally, the community has been engaged in identifying projects and programs to serve the area needs of this construction, and I appreciate the work that the New York City Parks has done to find more open space to serve thousands of residents impacted. The city needs to work closely with organizations like the Lower East Side Ecology Center, which has been a community steward of the park for over 20 years and needs to have a viable way of operating through the construction period and be incorporated into the new park design programmatically going forward. Uh, we've talked about uh, the need for making sure the fill is clean and that there are contaminated sites. Uh, I point across the river to the Guanas Canal where there's a community advisory group that is ongoing looking at cleanup. So such a group for this area ongoing will be important to make sure uh, that we uh, adhere to all the guidelines and have the safest uh, 
Phil. Uh, to support vulnerable communities, Congressman Velasquez has emphasized the importance of strengthening coastal resiliency uh, to counter the, stretch, uh, the threats of uh, sea level rise. Uh, to counter these threats, changing ocean conditions is imperative for the city to adopt strategies to protect uh, people's livelihoods. Uh, having the local community part of the solution ongoing uh, is key to that. Therefore, I ask the city to evaluate and consider the findings and recommendations of the independent report coming out. And I'm hopeful that we can continue to move forward to get this done. It's important for the Lower East Side waterfront communities we uh, we care deeply about the flood protection and, and environmental access and open space. And thank you, and I'm committed to work with you for resilient uh, Lower East Side. Thank you very much. Uh, particularly, thank you um, for your partnership, of course, with our elected officials, um, at, but most importantly with the community and the continued engagement and the passion uh, for the community, for the project, just to make sure that it is done right. I, I really, really thank you for that engagement and the ongoing engagement. Thank you, Borough President. If we can have your uh, written testimony for today, we'd love to have that as we well. We would probably just get it to later on. That's fine. Get it to. That's fine. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, we are going to go into uh, our public panels. Before we do, we're going to just let everyone know that we are going on to 4 o'clock, and so that everyone has a good night's sleep, we're going to put a time clock on. Um, so we're going to ask you to please, you know, summarize your testimony. We're going to put two minutes on the clock. If you have to leave, we encourage you to submit your written testimony um, to the New York City Council website with this particular subject matter prefaced. Ladies and gentlemen, just about 80 people have signed up to testify. So once again, we're going to call the first panel. We're going to ask you to please be mindful of the timer, which will be a two-minute timer. We're going to call Doris Huff from the Tenant Association, Danny Ramirez, Adam Hardkey, Community Board 6, Seth Corum, Stuyvesant Little League, Trevor Holland, Community Board 3. I'm just going to thank everybody for toughing it out for us today. We know that we've had a bad weather day, and this has been such an important matter. I'm just going to personally thank you all for being here and for your commitment to this project. Panel, you can begin whenever you're ready. Hi, Seth Corrin, representing the Peter Stuyvesant Little League. Um, as many of you know, uh, we represent 800 uh, baseball, softball, and special needs uh, children on the east side of Manhattan. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we are users he heavily of Murphy Brothers Park, as well as East River Park Fields, uh, and also uh, Con Ed's private facilities, which are also impacted by the project <clears throat> as, it re as it relates to uh, some of the space around the ball fields that uh, might be impacted. Um, I do want to publicly thank some of the elected officials here, uh, Councilman Powers, Councilwoman Rivera specifically, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer um, for their advoc advocacy for our program and for Youth Sports Manhattan and certainly to keep uh, the park space open and available throughout this project. Um, I also wanted to comment on um, uh, to support a comment made earlier by Commissioner Silver. Um, so all are aware, uh, twice in the last eight or nine months, we've been proactively reached out to by the Parks Department to assist with permitting needs and uh, adjustments to accommodate uh, us during the, the the project, so uh, we certainly appreciate that. Um, 
as it pertains to Murphy Brothers Park, we have over 400 uh, boys and girls playing uh, <clears throat> in that, uh, on those ball fields throughout the spring into the summer. And as Councilman Powers uh, referenced, uh, we're aware that uh, a comfort station is under consideration. And I uh, just wanted to uh, voice support for uh, the need for a bathroom space at the facility. There's hundreds and hundreds of, of, uh, of folks there and, and no suitable uh, facility anywhere nearby. So that would be extremely helpful and terrific it could be, if it could be included in, in the project. Um, further, uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, late adjustment to the phasing to uh, hopefully limit the loss of the space for just one season, presumably 2023, according to the timeline that's been presented. Um, and so um, we appreciate that. Uh, but just want to bring up uh, the necessity of support and maintenance for the facility between now and then because I know it's uh, been somewhat um, relegated to the dust pile in anticipation of work being done, but with three seasons to go until then, uh, the surface, fencing, turf, much can be needed. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I am Doris Huff. I am the TA president on my just last private side of Campus One. I have a total units of 269 units, a total of 924 residents. I am in support of the East Coastal Resiliency Project that needs to be started now, not covering it up, fixing it in 2023. I live right in front of Con Edison. When those transformers blew, I was right there. When that water was coming, we were right there with no help and nothing else from, well, I'm gonna rephrase that. We had help from the good old Lower East Side goals that saved more than 35 tenants' lives in my buildings that day. If it wasn't for them, I don't know what we would have did. Kavanaugh's office, several elected officials did help me, yes. But I'm a little upset today, what I heard today about, it's not gonna be covered, Cove, Diverson Cove, to 2023, that needs to be done now. I don't know if I gotta say this to the mayor de Blasio, who I gotta say it to, but it needs to be done now, not no 2023, right now. Lives depend on it. We lived there, we saw it. We had five to seven feet of water, and it is ridiculous that they think they can push that off to 2020, 23. I don't care about no grills, I no disrespect to nobody in here, no parks, but that needs to be done now. I care more about lives than having this happen a year from now, two years from now. What y'all gonna tell us? Sorry, we're, we're dead. Sorry, only people are dead. It's ridiculous. And I'm gonna hold people responsible for it. It doesn't make sense. And my last statement I wanna make today is, I can turn this over. That's said a mouthful. Um, <laughs> um, we had um, no heat, no hot water, and please, we all got to work together to build back, together. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for your testimony. No, I'm really mad. I'm sorry. This one here. Hi, good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Danny Ramirez, and I'm here with Oscar Fernandez representing the youth of the Lower East Side and the New York Giants Youth Baseball Club, a nonprofit organization on the Lower East Side aimed at providing activities for youth and their families, activities that keep our local youth safe and out of trouble as they learn to be responsible, productive citizens. I also stand here as a lifelong resident and concerned community member. Taking away our park would have had a huge impact on our community as a whole. So I was extremely happy to hear that the city has heard some of our concerns and has agreed to phase construction. Obviously, we need to wait on the information from Del Torres and Dr. Hans and them to really see how the project will impact the environment, as there are still others, other concerns from members of the community. So we'll wait on those, on that outcome, but at least for now, I'm glad to hear that, you know, the phasing was implemented and that, uh, you know, the timeline is not gonna be extended too far out, because like the young lady here said, um, you know, I also have a stake in this. Uh, both my parents, who are almost 80 years old, live across the street from East River Park, overlooking the tennis courts. I was born and raised there. 
lucky enough to stay in the neighborhood. I live on Third Street now. But, uh, you know, there was two and a half feet of water after Sandy uh, on the first floor of those projects there. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and again, uh, we don't want to see that happen again, but we also don't want to see the community lose access to that park, a park that, you know, as my parents get older, I see you know, how important it is, not only for them, but for their friends. My mother maintains her health by going and walking out there every single day around Easter. My father has Parkinson's, and um, his, his situation is deteriorating his health, but the park, going out there twice a week, you know, uh, the doctor has told us that's helping him as well. So, you know, there's thousands of people along that shoreline that are in the same exact uh, position. And again, it's just very good to hear that, uh, you know, they're gonna phase that. So uh, my next point, give me one second. I might go over that two minutes. By We're gonna two. ask you to wrap up. You, your time is up. I will, no problem here. So I wanna thank Gil Brewer's office, Ms. Chin, Mr. Power, and especially Carlina Rivera's office for being so informative and accessible for bringing the, and, and for bringing the community's concerns to the table. In conclusion, I'd like to reiterate how important it is for the city to communicate with our elected officials in a timely manner. Not doing so leads to many rumors and bad experiences between not only members of the community, but also between elected officials and those community members that actually stood up for them when they were running for office. In order for us to have transparency and feel included in the process, there must be consistent communication between all parties. It should not have taken months for Carlina's office to get answers to the first question that she asked today, which was, why was alternative number three dropped by the city and the decision was made to go with alternative number four? Unreal that she had to wait until today to get answers to that, as I'm sure that she and many others have asked that same question countless times over the last five or six months. We must do a better job on communication. And I hope that the people who are speaking for de Blasio's office here hear this and, and we can do a better job of that going forward. Thank you all for your time today, and I'm sorry that I took up so much time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Harkey. I am vice chair of CB6's Land Use and Waterfront Committee. In addition to my duties on CB6, I am also a frequent user of East River Park. I'm here today to reiterate CB6's resolution regarding the ESCR. Though our total area is small compared to the overall project, our board spoke to the concerns that directly affect our district and for the spillover consequences from the long-term closures. Thank you to our council members Rivera and Powers for addressing these concerns and their questions. Specifically, uh, the Comfort Station and Murphy Brothers Park mitigation or <clears throat> impacts to Waterside Plaza and uh, the floodgate deployment on uh, First Avenue. Regarding the overall project, a chief concern was the lack of phasing. This issue seems to have been resolved based on the news from yesterday. The board welcomes a phased approach as will allow community members to enjoy access to parkland during construction, which I remind you, CB6 has some of the least amount of parkland in the entire five boroughs. Mitigation efforts should include enhancements to Waterside Pier for both active and passive uses, other existing areas to compensate for lost parkland, improved pedestrian access through signal retiming at 18th Street and Avenue C, Further consideration should also be given to the pedestrian and cycle mitigations and improvements, such as the proposed flyover bridge. Thank you to Councilmem Councilmember Powers for inquiring about this issue further. Though we as a board are thankful for the guaranteed earmark, we urge the city agencies to work together to ensure that construction do, uh, is completed during the park closure. Bifurcating the park for an additional two years is unacceptable. Finally, further consideration should be given to the expanded summer streets and study reevaluation uh, to the current state of the FDR. Thank you to Council Member Rivera for bringing up the issue of the FDR and suggesting a solution of limited closures similar to the Bronx River Parkway in Westchester County. Speaking as an individual, we as a city and community are being asked to sacrifice a tremendous amount of capital, both financial and human, for this project. If we are building for the future, we must explore real solutions to the FDR and beyond for this project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Trevor Holland. I'm the chair of Community Boards 3, Parks, Recreation, Waterfront, and Resiliency Committee. In October 2012, Hurricane Sandy caused extensive coastal flooding in Community Board 3, resulting in significant damage to residential and commercial property, open space, transportation, power supply, and water and sewer infrastructure. In many ways, our community still suffers from the effects of that catastrophic storm seven years later. We all understand that with climate change, the city will see an increase in the frequency of, most, of the most intense storms as well as rising sea levels. 
We have asked the city to come up with a plan to protect our neighborhood, especially our most vulnerable neighborhoods that include large areas of NYCHA and affordable housing. To address this vulnerability, the City of New York is proposing a bold plan to construct the ESCR. The ESCR project is a multi-agency initiative that was selected by HUD to receive disaster recovery grant funding through the Rebuild by Design competition organized in response to the devastation of Superstar Sandy in order to promote enhanced resiliency in impacted communities. For many in, the, in this community, for many in the community, the ESCR process since fall 2008 has frayed trust in government and public agencies because of the drastic change in plan design done without community consulta consultation despite the needs of community, other community who look to their government to supply, des to supply desperately needed protection of their lives and home. And although the city has regularly engaged the community since the selection of the preferred alterna alternative, the community board has been challenged with rendering a resolution, resolution that balances the needs of coastal resiliency while addressing the concerns of those most impacted. One of our biggest challenges has been battling misinformation and we have created a chart which is attached to show the differences between the previous plan and the current preferred plan. We still continue to have many concerns which we have outlined in our attached resolution, including what we heard repeatedly at all meetings, phase construction. We spent hundreds of hours reviewing the preferred alternative, listened patiently to hours of testimony and held or attended dozens of meetings. We understand that raising the river's edge does not come with some controversy. However, based on the information we have today, Community Board 3 supports this deal of action with the list of conditions outlined in our attached resolution. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, panel. Appreciate your time today. This was a panel in favor of the proposal. I'm going to call a panel two in opposition of the proposal. Diane Lake, Lucy Cotier, Rita Freed, Laura Sewell, and Kendra Kruger. Thank you, panel. Please be mindful of the time clock. You may begin. Can you shift on? Hi, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Diane Lake. I'm a member of the steering committee of the East River Alliance, which is a coalition of stakeholders in the Lower East Side and East Village. Our community lived through Sandy and understands the need for resiliency work. We want a resiliency plan that will protect us from storm surges and climate change. The city has proposed preferred alternative four. We have given the city strong, consistent feedback on the flaws in alternative four for nearly a year, and we were pleased to learn yesterday that the city listened and plans to proceed with the East River Park work in phases. However, our other concerns with alternative four remain unaddressed and that's what we want to bring your attention to today. This is still a plan to completely destroy East River Park and raise it eight to 10 feet. It's very destructive and very expensive. Borough President Brewer and Council Member Rivera have uh, hired that independent consultant to review both alternative three and alternative four. And we strongly encourage the city council not to vote until after that report is available and has been thoroughly reviewed. We also remain concerned about the health, safety, and well-being of our community before and during construction. We ask the City Council to support further changes so that the final plan includes protection from storms and floods before and during construction, as you just heard TAA Huff ask for. Reducing the total amount of destruction to only what's absolutely necessary. Meaningful alternatives for recreation during construction, particularly for children and seniors. A clear plan for the future of the Lower East Side Ecology Center, reduced impact on biodiversity, 
and that the impact on frontline communities be central to any plan or timeline that the city considers. While we appreciate the progress that was made yesterday, at this time the East River Alliance does not support Alternative 4 in its current form. Thank you for listening to us, and we hope you'll consider the community's additional concerns. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lucy Cotine. Um, speaking for myself at the moment. Uh, this is a quote from the Parks Department's website. A large healthy tree removes almost 70 times more air pollution each year than a small newly planted tree. Yet all over the city we see tree cutting by the Parks Department and denaturing projects taking place. This is not the pro-resiliency acts we expect from a city that claims it wants to increase resiliency. I am horrified by this project that says it will remove the whole top of the ERP and then replace it, as if they were picking up an old carpet, placing down a new floor, and then laying the intact carpet back down. Nature does not work that way. I am not an expert on this project, but there are many experts to be spoken with that have not been consulted or listened to. Our politicians are not experts either. Since we know that in this city there's nothing that does not go on, that does not have the fingerprints of big real estate sewn into the project, we need to know more about how they might be involved. Why did Deputy Mayor Dean Fullahan overnight declare that they had to reverse the agreed upon plan without any community discussion? What is the involvement of AECOM that is involved in many big real estate projects throughout the city? Are there forces that are imagining another Brooklyn Bridge Park or Hudson River Park where private interests have taken over the public need for open green space? What are the long-term plans for the NYCHA buildings across the street? The new NYCHA chair, Gregory Russ, has a history of privatizing public housing. There are many environmental and political questions that have not been answered. Until every question is answered, this project must be halted and immediate temporary measures must be taken to protect the NYCHA residents who are still suffering from the effects of Hurricane Sandy. One other thing, the city never hesitates to close lanes of streets and highways to do repairs for extended lengths of time. How is it that part of the rationale for this change plan is to eliminate the need to close one lane of the FDR at night for construction? This is the first time I have ever seen concern for the inconvenience of drivers, and I have been driving the streets and highways of New York City for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rita Freed. I'm from the Bronx, where we have been fighting for seven years to stop the Parks Department from paving the unique Putnam Nature Trail, a wetland trail that serves a mostly working class community of Kingsbridge into a, an environmentally harmful and pedestrian endangering bike speedway. I'm here not as a ringer, but because there's a citywide pattern in both the case of the Putnam and Fort Green Park where they want to uh, cut down a mature grove and pave it over in the name in that case of access, as with the Putnam Trail. And uh, apparently with the East River Park, it's in the name of flood resiliency. But again, they want to, the final result would be to pave over nature. Uh, by the way, a word I haven't heard here today from anybody except Lucy, nature. How can you talk about climate crisis and not mention the word nature? The, there is the common pattern is that there is deception, no surveys of users of the trail, a, a, a plan that's given to just prune trees turns into mass destruction of the Fort Greene mature grove, same here with the East River Park, and we have also in common that there are real estate interests, that the adjoining areas are ripe to be gentrified. Nature is not a profit center, but when you pave it, you know, Parks Department is not just penny-wise, their asphalt is the default attitude, also means once you pave it, you can public-private partnerize it, you can commercialize it. Once you can commercialize it, you can gentrify next to it. We have to take nature as the guideline here. Nature is the most basic common good. 
If they can take away nature, they can take away all your basic social needs, education, housing, medical care, everything. Thank you for and your testimony. And only the working people can stop that. The most basic approach for all public servants who s claim to represent the common good is when it comes to nature, save it, don't pave it. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kendra Kruger. I was born and raised in the Lower East Side, Lower East Side, also uh, the original land of the Lenape indigenous people. I am an engineer, scientist, and educator, and I have expertise in sustainability and regenerative design. I'm opposing the current plan because I feel as though it fails to address that resiliency is not just about protecting ourselves from climate change, but it's also about healing our environment and our communities so that these crises will not continue to threaten us and our descendants. Yes, it is a complex issue. Yes, there is urgency, unknowns, uncertainty, but this should not curb our creativity. It should fuel it. Yes, this is an opportunity, an opportunity to create an extraordinary design, to be a global leader in scientific, environmental, and social progressiveness. I'm trained in a design philosophy called permaculture, which asks, how can we move beyond sustainability and into a regenerative paradigm? Sustainability is all about not doing too much harm to the environment, but regenerative design asks, how can we actively heal the damage that has been done to our environment and our communities that have been historically and purposefully disenfranchised? It's no coincidence that most of the public housing in the city is in environmentally compromised areas such as flood zones and polluted land such as the gas plant that is underneath the Reese housing that is right across the street from the East River Park. Yes, this is a moral imperative, as, they, as they've mentioned, but a moral imperative to acknowledge that resiliency is about healing the damage that has been done, again, to our environment and our social ecosystems. There is research and science and resources that are available that people are studying here in New York at some of our world-class research institutes at CUNY on things like uh, uh, oyster reefs, bioswales, salt marshes, carbon sequestration strategies, curb cuts for inland flooding, semi-permeable surfaces, green walls, roofs, public house, green walls and roofs and, and, uh, and, and green roofs green walls on public housing, and yes, it's complex, it's intersectional, and what are we going to sac sacrifice, and what are the, the city officials going to sacrifice, and those sacrifices shouldn't be made by our community or for our environment, by, by, by those who don't have the imagination to have courage to find extraordinary solutions. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Laura Sewell. I'm the executive director of the East Village Community Coalition. And in that capacity, I'd very much like to thank everyone who's here today and has been working on this issue. Our community's amazing, and you're seeing that. Uh, I also serve on the board of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, an invited Section 106 consultant on the architectural resources in East River Park. And I'd first like to correct an error on page seven of chapter 5.4 in the final EIS, which states that Lesby declined to participate in the section 106 process. We, in fact, accepted the invitation from the Office of Management and Budget, and responses to our comments can be found in the final environmental impact statement. And we would like to see this, this error corrected because we very much spent a good deal of time and effort in accepting this invitation and responding. Um, there are three historic structures with date from the early years of East River Park. The Marine Engine Company 66 Fireboat House, currently the home of the Lower East Side Ecology Center, and two Art Deco style comfort stations. All three of these buildings would be seriously impacted or destroyed by the preferred alternative, Alternative 4 plan. Uh, the New York State Historic Preservation Office has determined the fireboat house to be eligible for the state and national register. Lesby agrees with, with Shapo that the building has architectural and historic value that warrants preservation. We also believe that because the fireboat house has historically had a strong tie to the waterfront, it should be preserved in place. This scheme presents challenges, primarily that any plan to raise the height of the park will have a significant impact on the public's ability to view and appreciate this building and for it to serve its essential purpose. But we believe that these challenges can be met, again, with creativity and forethought. 
and recommend that a new wall be placed but a sufficient distance back from the fireboat house to allow it to be adequately viewed and protected from surge. Uh, as regarding the Art Deco comfort stations, the idea of considering them was dismissed because LPC and SHPO had not identified them as architectural resources, but to the best of Lesby's knowledge, they have not had the opportunity to study them. We will submit our full comments um, via the website so you have them. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you, panel. Thank you for your passion. Panel three is in favor of the proposal. Damaris Reyes. Uh, Roland Lewis, Yvette Rivera, Dave Braswell, and Nancy Ortiz. Maria Trinidad. You may begin whenever you're ready. Hi, my name is uh, Damaris Reyes. I'm the executive director of Good Old Lower East Side. I'm also a lifelong resident of the Lower East Side. I live in public housing at Baruch Houses. And I just want to make a correction. Um, at this point, we are undecided. We are neither in favor or in opposition. But we do think that there um, are some important things we want to say. Um, I'm with Goals. Goals has been around for 40 years. We do housing work, land use work. Uh, we work with seniors, youth, uh, we work on a number of different issues, and uh, we serve about 10,000 people every year, and during uh, hurricane, um, hurricane Superstorm Sandy, we rose to the occasion to serve and serve as first responders to about 15,000 households in the neighborhood. And so we know firsthand the impacts. I mean, I personally experienced flooding in and around my building and utilities and all the things that everybody here is talking about. Those are all real things, um, things that caused a lot of trauma and things that still are still being worked on. And you know, as, a, as residents, many of us are still experiencing that long-term trauma. Sometimes it's very difficult for even me to talk about this without having an emotion, you know, an, a moment. Um, Along the waterfront, is the, it's, it's lined with NYCHA, public housing, and other low-income housing. It's among the most vulnerable in our neighborhood, and we were the hardest hit. And there's a lot of evidence about the impact that climate change, sea level rising, and the storm had on our neighborhood. All you have to do is walk through our developments to see the gaping holes, the construction, the pipes. I mean, on a daily basis, we are still living with those impacts. Just yesterday, another pipe was damaged due to the construction that is happening because of FEMA. And so we're living with these impacts all the time. And you know, though this is a plan that has a lot of questions, um, the neighborhood still feels like we want to be protected by, we want to be protected from the flooding. Um, I, I know I'm going over, but I do want to say that we spent a lot of time working on this plan. 
Uh, we spent countless hours. We reached hundreds of residents, and we came up with something that we thought was palatable for all of us, something that we could live with. The city turned around, changed courses without consulting with us, and that has created all this contention that you're hearing about. A community that has historically worked together to create change in a lot of ways is at odds with each other. But with that being said, I'm pleased with the idea of phasing the closure of the park, but there are still so many things that need to be worked out. I want to say that we concur with a lot of the recommendations made by um, Borough President Gail Brewer, many of the concerns being raised by many of the residents in this room, and then there are a few really quick quick recommendations that we want to make sure happen, and we will be submitting much longer testimony because obviously two minutes does not give you enough time. But we want to make sure that whatever happens, that there is a community advisory task force in place that will have strength that the city will recognize as an equal partner throughout whatever process we ultimately undergo. We want to make sure that there's ongoing air monitoring that's reported to the community. We want to also make sure that the Ecology Center has a place during and after whatever we ultimately decide as a community. Um, we want to, to, to exp explore alternative measures for any of the trees and, and flora that is being, um, that may be transplanted from the park. And we want to also look at further measures to work with the housing authority that has a lot of green open space that can also help to expand our coastal flood protection. And then finally, um, long term, we want to make sure that whatever we come up with, that it is worthy of the global attention that we have received for this park and would make it educational around climate change issues. You know, we got to find the silver lining in this moment and use this opportunity to educate our seniors, our young people alike moving forward. And um, finally, um, the last thing I want to say is whatever we do as a community, it is imperative, imperative that we continue to look for alternative spaces where we can have passive, active recreation as a neighborhood. I live across the street. I, I can see the park from my window and the East River. And just that process of itself and losing that ability is going to have an impact on my life. I understand this is that some, something has to happen, something may be necessary, but we've got to come up with a plan that we can all live with. So what I'm asking the city to do is to really listen to the recommendations, both of our council member, of all the people in this room, and help us as a community get to a yes for coastal flood protection, because in the end, what we don't want is to be underwater. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank Just you. And I'm sorry I went over. You're fine. Just to remind everyone uh, who wants to submit written testimony, it's hearings at nyc.council.gov. Once again, it's hearings at nyc.council.gov. Your subject matter would be ESCR. Okay? Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm Roland Lewis, uh, president of the Waterfront Alliance, uh, an alliance of over 1,100 civic and business organizations around the metropolitan area. Um, I just actually concur uh, that uh, one point uh, the previous speaker made about going to school on this uh, on this project. We have to learn uh, uh, what's going right, what's going wrong, because it's we are going. This entire metropolitan region needs to do work like they're doing here on the Lower East Side uh, going forward. Um, so uh, very quickly, a couple of brief points, and then um, I'd like to talk about a, uh, a, a tool we have. Uh, we uh, hope that this, this project goes forward. We'll move all the construction material by barge. That's a 90 percent reduction. Councilwoman Barron's good point about how, what kind of fuel we use is something to be investigated. There are regulations that are in place and that we can use, uh, use better uh, lower NOx uh, fuel for those kind of barges, but it does, uh, getting those trucks away from the construction site is a, is a net, very big net plus. Uh, the phasing of the project has been talked about. I do believe it's a, a good good thing and, and thankful that we're doing that. Um, we uh, also want to uh, work with the design to allow for more uh, access to the park and to the park from to the water during construction and after construction. That's possible and can be done. Uh, and last, I do want to talk about the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, Wards 1, 
uh, Board 6 and almost Board 3 have taken the wedge pledge, as have 28 other community boards around the city, uh, which is a design guidelines program similar to LEED for buildings that encourages ecology, encourages resiliency, and encourages um, access wherever possible on the water's edge. It also it gives you points for community participation, which uh, this project is probably um, a little, little lower on the scale it has been uh, historically. Uh, so uh, uh, we, as you go forward, the, the change we just had with uh, the phasing, uh, when, when, when complete this one last thought, the, the, the change that we've had for the phasing is indicative of changes that can be made by the construction team and by the city as we go forward. So the, the uh, input from the Netherlands uh, group that's coming forward uh, uh, next week, the points made by uh, other folks here at this hearing can be incorporated. Let's make this a model. Let's make this a, a lesson learned for other neighborhoods, other places around the city. Uh, written testimony is submitted and we lo look forward to working with the council and with the city to make this the best project can, can be going forward. Thank you very much. I just want to correct the, uh, the, the website that I just gave. I inverted some words. So it's hearings at council dot nyc.gov. All right. Hearings at council dot nyc.gov. You may continue. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Yvette Rivera and I am the vice president of the LES OLS Little League which is the oldest and largest Little League on the Lower East Side. Our league has existed for over 60 years and we have over 350 children and their families participating, mostly low-income families that will be impacted by the planned ESCR project in East River Park. While we are in favor of flood protection, we have several concerns and needs that should be addressed, including, and while we repeated that the phase construction is a great idea, I wanna make sure that it is continued that there is not a phase five that changes that. This approach will allow our kids to still play sports within walking distance of their homes for years until park renovation is complete. We prefer to have access to half the park over four to six years versus full closure for three to five years. Alternative park space should prioritize children and local community programs like our league. There are very few park spaces that can accommodate baseball fields within walking distance of our players. Our kids should be prioritized for this space. We recently met with the Parks Department to discuss the alternative field space and the initial meeting was productive. But like everyone else, we are awaiting details on local field allocation. Our league is large and provides services to the immediate surrounding community. We should also receive priority for allocation of field space once the East River Park renovation is complete. Present plan will eliminate field eight which is a priority field for our games each Saturday. Preserving all eight ball fields or reallocating the same amount of field space in the remaining seven ball fields, based on the new plan, to the LES OLS Little League is a must. I, like many other league participants, live in very close proximity to the East River Park in the co-ops and will be most affected during the years of construction by airborne dust contamination, noise, and lack of park space. Therefore, we request that our concerns above be addressed with a detailed action plan before the community and the city signs off on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Camille Napoleon from Baruch Houses. NYCHA properties have approximately 18,000 po in population across from Avenue C and 13th Street to Montgomery Street. NYCHA is the front line, the wall, the barrier, the first to get flooded, yet seven years later, we are still suffering the impact of Sandy. My name is Camille Napoleon, and I am the current vice president for Baruch Houses, the largest NYCHA development in Manhattan. We at Baruch Houses support the current plan for the East River flood protection. It is of the utmost importance for us at Baruch Houses. For many, when the waters receded, their problems did too. For my 5,000 plus residents and I, Baruch Houses, we are still dealing with the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. My development finally broke ground early this year to make necessary repairs almost seven years after the Superstorm left my development devastated. Having my residents displaced for weeks, those that stood behind feeling vulnerable, finding ourselves asking for meals, 
to feed our elderly, many who refuse to leave, having to travel all the way uptown to find food and necessary life-sustaining items because all of our local stores were left without electricity. For these reasons and so many others, I ask that the current plan be approved. My residents are still struggling daily to get through the effects of Sandy. Please make flood protection the priority for all of us at NYCHA. Residents and we say yes to the current plan. And as an aftermath, we have suffered a, 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 a gas outage, an electrical outage, due to the overturn of a cement truck from construction. And recently, Reese Houses also suffered a possible uh, ev evacuation due to a crane possibly affecting one of the buildings. So yes, we are highly affected. And I thank you. Now, I will speak on behalf of Nancy Ortiz, <laughs> resident leader of Aladdick Houses. I, I submitted to, I did. I cannot. We have one person per slip of paper, and that was my question to the council member when we saw the entry. So we accepted you as one person speaking on behalf of two, not giving two separate testimonies. Yeah, I had asked, and he said just take both names on the same slip. Okay. All right. We have to move on. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Trinidad, and I am the Tenant Association President of NYCHA. My eye. Yeah, just poked it. <laughs> Development at 344 East 28th Street. I have lived in this building for 48 years. I consider myself the electric, the electric caretaker of my neighbors, which is why I am here to speak about the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. October 29, 2012, I was sitting in my apartment, looking out the window, waiting for Hurricane Sandy to hit land. I had my elderly mother, in an emergency bag because I was ready to leave as soon as I saw flooding. I thought I was prepared, but I don't think anyone could have prepared me for what we experienced that week. After Hurricane Sandy hit Manhattan, my residents and I were left for a week without water or electricity. I walked up more than 20 flights of stairs a day in order to check on my residents. Some were homebound, others were too fragile to walk or had family members to watch for the next week, I would travel to bring them back water, food, and anything else they needed. I couldn't leave my apartment without running into a resident that needed my help. But it wasn't just me. There were other NYCHA residents in the Lower East Side with no power, no electricity, and flooding in their buildings. I will never forget that week, and I hope no one else has to go through what me and the other residents experienced. This is why I am asking the city provide us with flood protection and I believe this project will provide us with this protection. Climate change is happening whether we like it or not, and we have to be prepared. However, I want the city to do everything it can to make sure the community is taken care of while construction is happening. I'm happy that parts of the park will remain open. I also want to be sure that all the teams find a place to play. I also want to, for the city to keep the noise and air pollution to a minimum so NYCHA residents aren't impacted but I don't want to wait another seven years to get started. I want all of my friends and neighbors protected as soon as possible, so I hope you can all come to an agreement quickly and vote to make this project happen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I thank the panel for your time and your testimony today. Thank you. The next panel is Daniel Tainer, Rita Kelly, Murphy, I think it's Nickel, Fanny Ipe and Bonnie Lane Weber.
Dr. Amy Burkhoff. Panel, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, council members, for sticking around to listen to all our testimony. Um, I've testified many times here, community board. Um, so today I decided to uh, read a story that was written by uh, a teacher friend at PS 110 on Delancey and uh, Lewis Street, close in the flood zone, uh, wrote shared this with me. They asked permission of the student's parents and the student themselves. So, once it was a beautiful day in New York City, then my dad tried to evacuate, but then the car broke down. Next, my dad buyed supplies. After that, Hurricane Sandy came. It was Category 3 hurricane with wind above 115 miles per hour. Things were damaged around the whole city. Then the power went off. I was scared. My mom, dad, and I waited after the hurricane striked everywhere was flooded. People got rescued. Then everyone went to work fixing things like power lines, house, subway tunnels, uh, cleaning debris. A couple weeks later, power went on. But still, they had lots of fix like subway tunnel. A few years later, they had to fix the L train tunnel. After people knew the hurricane, people never wanted a hurricane like Sandy to hit New York City as a Category 3. But they still work today. A month ago, they want the East River Park torn down to have a giant wall on East River Park and cover the whole park as a landfill. They put up signs, then there was a protest for not to bury the park. Finally, they didn't turn it into a landfill, instead they kept the park. I hope a hurricane like Sandy will never happen again. So I, I read this just as to express what one resident uh, without prompting a uh, reaction to this, uh, to the current plan uh, preferred option by the city for, there were some communication uh, and scientific errors, but the city has also been doing, uh, the city agencies have also had communication and uh, scientific errors in the plan that they have presented. So uh, I hope that the city council takes the opportunity to listen to us residents and to make sure this is the plan that we wanted. Thank you. Hi, my name is Murphy and uh, I, I feel like um, I'm speaking as a ghost uh, the ghost of the trees, the ghost of the park, the ghost of the lungs of the children that are going to be negatively affected during construction and after construction. If you think about it, you're going to have an eight to ten foot wall next to FDR Drive where the fumes going to go, which used to go more into the river to highly um, high bad uh, asthma rates, respiratory problems in that area are high, and this is obviously going to cause bigger problems. Uh, trees may help us breathe. Without trees, we uh, cannot breathe. So, you know, we are uh, New York City 2019. We're spending $1.4 billion to destroy perfectly good 80 year old trees that are older than most people here. It's disrespectful to life itself. Um, what else? Uh, the way we're going about this, the City Council Planning Commission voted. Uh, for this plan on the day Greta Thunberg was going nuts telling world leaders, you know, what, what, like I as a child should not be telling adults what to do and I find myself in the position of the child and so, same, same with this uh, uh, person here, like uh, the um, trees are like uh, the, the living beings, like we are living beings, like we have to understand destroying, spending this amount of money to destroy perfectly good things that are working for us is nothing short of madness. Uh, we need to come up with a better plan. We, you know, we are smart, intelligent people. Don't destroy this, this park that works for like 
uh, the nature, like we are nature. We're destroying nature. It's like, it's just like um, people, uh, Americans suffer 40 to 60% of mental health issues Americans have. Uh, nature helps that, Harvard research studies, etc. This is a horrible plan. And the way it's presented, like uh, some joker saying, the, 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 there's already flooding, uh, closing the park recently. I'm in the park every day. This has not happened. This, uh, there's, uh, the city spent $66 million uh, doing the Esplanade. It took them 10 years. Now they're going to spend $1.4 billion, and then they're going to do it in three and a half years. Give me a break. This is not true. This is not true. You're, the, the city does not know that we're spending one point. 90% of New Yorkers are unaware of this project. This, this is like a sham of democracy. This is USSR 1970 or something. Thank you for so, your testimony. Thank you, and I hope that we can actually move forward properly. Thank like you not, so much. Not, not, being, not with, with the interest of people, thank you not so much. cars and money. Thank, thank you. you. Hi. Um, my name is Fanny Ip. I grew up on the Low East Side, and I am a regular user of East River Park. It has been mentioned throughout this process that this preferred alternative is for the protection of the people. However, when you look at the parts of the plan, it says otherwise. The poor air quality from the dust and the many construction vehicle emissions will be detrimental to public health, especially to the elderly, the children, the people with asthma. Control measures proposed such as spraying down dirt piles with water or covering them while transport, it's not sufficient. Mitigations for contaminated soil and hazardous materials still, not, still need to be addressed. This was also a concern of Con Edison's as stated under the hazardous materials contamination section in their DEIS comments dated August 30th, 2019. More importantly, it will be seven years since Sandy, and we still haven't gotten any flood protection. How are we supposed to believe that the city is in the interest of protecting the people when not only do, do we not have flood protection right now, there will be none during construction as well? And finally, the mayor stated in his press release yesterday, we are building a more resilient city to meet the challenge of global warming head on. Well, cutting down almost a thousand mature trees right next to the FDR definitely does not meet that challenge. If anything, it contributes to the problem of global warming and helps speed up sea level rise, making this plan obsolete probably a, probably a few years after it is, it is finally complete. Not to mention, the whole Low East Side area will be a lot hotter when these trees are gone. I ask you, please do not be fooled by this small concession we received yesterday, something we would have gotten anyway with that ridiculous time frame of three and a half years. There are many issues that, are st that, needs, that still need to be addressed, and since the timeline has been delayed, other alternatives, such as one that is less harmful and less destructive to the environment, should be revisited. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bonnie Lane Weber. I'm representing the Sierra Club of the New York City Group. And I'm going to skip the introduction and go right to uh, the Sierra Club group opposes the adoption of any plan and calls for the City Planning Commission to reject any plan unless it incorporates these conditions. The East River neighborhoods must receive the same maximum degree of flood protection as other Manhattan waterfront neighborhoods. The residential buildings closest to the river abutting the East River Park comprise the city's largest concentration of NYCHA public housing, whose residents include low-income, working individuals and families, seniors and children, and a disproportionately high number of individuals with chronic medical conditions. This population suffered greatly during Superstorm Sandy and deserves the same protection as planned for all other vulnerable Manhattan residents. The construction period must utilize state-of-the-art green technology and power to avoid or minimize emissions, excessive noise, and environmental degradation. To assure this, the city must appoint an environmental watchdog vetted by Community Board 3 and environmental organizations to monitor and mandate compliance with this point throughout the project. 
Any final, uh, I'm gonna skip. Children and seniors must be cared for. We care a lot about the trees. Any soil in full must be clean. I could go on about that. And additionally, the city must seek to apply federal and other funds. The money sitting there, to my understanding, uh, with HUD, I know Carolyn Maloney gave, I think, $339 million and nothing has been done with it. The city must seek to apply federal and other funds to immediately implement flood protection and environmental improvement to NYCHA and other buildings in immediate proximity to the East River. Such measures must include, but not necessarily be limited to, temporary flood barriers, elevating or protecting boilers, and other building infrastructure currently underground, mold remediation, and tree and other green planting. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Burkhoff, an ecologist at the City College of New York and a 40-year resident of the East Village. But today I'm going to start not with my own words, but with a few words from Attorney General Tish James that were submitted in her letter to the uh, final environmental impact statement, Appendix M. The draft EIS's environmental justice analysis and its treatment of impacts to open space uses, tree canopy, and air quality do not meet the requirements of federal, state, and New York City law governing environmental review. These treatments are also arbitrary and capricious in violation of federal and state administrative law requirements. Uh, phased construction may alleviate some of these concerns about open space, but the Attorney General goes on in the next 11 pages to describe problems with the circumscription of area used to evaluate disproportionate impact on moderate and low-income people, the methods used to quantify tree replacement, and there is a relationship between those two things, and the lack of mitigation for potential increases in air pollution during construction. So I thank Attorney General James for pointing out the shaky legal ground supporting the city's plan to destroy 83 acres of New York City waterfront park. In addition, if the city really intends to create a livable future for the next generation, why didn't they assemble a panel of independent experts nine months ago to assure us that this was a real, that this was the best that we could do? Um, why haven't they incorporated up-to-date estimates of sea level rise? and provide flood barriers that aim to protect us through 2100, not the 2050s. There's where we are here, and I just, high level estimates are business as usual estimates, and I don't see how even with an additional two feet of fill, that gets us to those numbers. And in addition, if they put in this additional fill, how does that not impact the 1442 saplings and all the new infrastructure? So I oppose the plan, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you so much, panel, for your time and your testimony. We appreciate it. We're going to call up the next panel. Vela Tina Jones, Christine Bookin, Lynn Kelly, Sabura Abdur Rashid, and Inez de la Nunez. Nuez, sorry. Panel, you can begin. Good afternoon. Um, I am a resident at a um, privately managed NYCHA owned. Excuse me, can you just state your name for the record? Oh, okay. Sabora Abdur Rashid. So um, I've been listening to what everyone has been saying. And um, first of all, I would like to say I'm glad 
that this um, fourth plan includes a phased um, construction. I am concerned about the um, pollution in the air um, that can result. But I, I also have to say that the saying, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, we have to have flood prevention. We can wait, we can keep you know, looking at more plans and more plans and more plans, and that can take another 10 years. And um, where I live, there was two feet of water in front of everyone's door. So um, when we talk about nature, there's nothing natural about living in the projects or the FDR Drive or, I mean, you know, we have to come to some kind of compromise. So I have to support the plan. Um, I trust that uh, Councilwoman uh, Rivera and our borough president will, and, and other elected officials will look at the best um, uh, possibilities that will be uh, protective of the environment. I also want to add, at, because it's going to happen one way or another, I would also like to add um, that people who are in the projects and people who have been most affected by this, uh, low-income residents, are given opportunities to work in the construction of this, this new project, that um, there are green um, uh, apprenticeships for the young people, and when it is completed, because it is going to be done, that there are vendor opportunities for people to sell, uh, just like in Central Park, to sell um, snacks and things like that. So um, I'll include more in a written statement. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, my, my name is Emily Walker. I'm the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. Our Executive Director, Lynn Kelly, regrets that she couldn't stay to deliver this testimony, but I want to thank the Council members for staying to listen to the public's comments today on this important project, which will have not only local impacts, but will also set the precedent for public resiliency projects citywide. The city faces numerous challenges as it seeks to balance the complex engineering needs of this project with the realities of the location itself. We also understand that it is not a matter of if the next Superstorm Sandy happens, but when. I want to add on a personal note, I was a longtime resident of the East Village that lived through Sandy's flooding and a former daily user of East River Park. Um, so we believe that the need to revitalize East River Park as a public open space that can also offer flood protection is urgent and essential to the protection of residents of the East Village and Lower East side. Um, we were really thrilled to see that the city has recently announced the phasing of the construction of the park, but we also believe that while the city has committed resources to provide some level of mitigation for the temporary loss of major sections of the park, we think more can be done to um, strongly encourage continued interagency coordination on these mitigation measures between agency partners at NYCHA, the Department of Education, the Department of Transportation, and we want to ensure that um, Parks offers its best practices to these agencies as they um, operate these mitigation spaces during the period of construction. The current proposal for rebuilding the park would involve the, involve the total loss of the canopy that exists in East River Park today, and we urge parks and DDC to incorporate a wide range of horticultural variety in the new park plantings, and we also strongly encourage the city to plant trees that are more mature in their growth cycle than a standard sapling um, to the greatest extent possible. Furthermore, in relation to the street tree mitigation plan that the city is moving forward with, we commend this as an important infrastructure change for the inland communities um, that are going to be impacted by the park construction but we also believe it is essential that the city dedicate increased maintenance funding specifically for those new street tree plantings. Um, and finally, I just want to add that we think maintenance is a matter of protecting our capital investments, and we think any conversation about a $1.4 billion construction project is a non-starter without an appropriate baseline commitment to more full-time maintenance and operations staff to work in the park once it is complete. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I welcome any questions you may have. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Inés de la Nuez, and I work at Grand Street Settlement, providing services for seniors. So um, basically, my concern is safety, safety for the community, safety for our most frail. I was there, um, I think it was a Tuesday after Sandy, and I was able to see how our community, especially the seniors, were affected. Um, building without electricity, without running water, without elevator working for two or three days. So we were basically there making sure that the senior had access to resources and connecting them to services needed in the community. So I just want to make sure that whatever plan, you know, is picked, keep into consideration our community, our safety, and our seniors. And I also can see that the seniors were different before Sandy and after Sandy. Now you see that they don't have that sense of security anymore. And for example, when you see, when they see on TV that the world is changing, anything like that, they worry, they're, they're concerned about what's gonna happen. So we need to alleviate that um, by making sure that whatever we pick, keep into consideration that we need to provide services to them to provide access to them. So community resources also, not only, you know, making sure that we don't get flooded, access, and also, I mean, there was a plan for people to be, you know, evacuated from the building, but that, that really didn't work because a lot of the seniors, they didn't want to do that, especially the frail ones. They wanted to stay in the community. So we want to make sure that we enable them to stay safe in their community by providing the services and connecting them to the services that they need. I want to urge our elected official that when a decision is made, which is going to be the best option, they keep that into consideration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valentina Jones. I'm here on behalf of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. I'm a retired registered nurse and a licensed mental health counselor. The Lower East Side Power Partnership supports the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. We don't feel we have adequate information or expertise to evaluate whether the city's preferred alternative for the plan is the best approach. Presently, we have not seen the report from the independent expert. Uh, but we are for certain things. We advocate for flood, flood protection of Lower East Side residents. One of the pictures you have here is part of a PowerPoint that was taken to different developments. This building over here could be any one of Baruch, Lillian Wall, Jacob Reese, etc. And this is their building being flooded. And this was shown to them. The one below it, and you all have a picture, the one below it shows what they can do in terms of a plan. One of the issues that we had is that you see it comes down. So we kind of wondered, well, where is this water going? Because it looks like it's going on the FDR Drive and could possibly go over to people's houses. So the next uh, PowerPoint is something that shows where the drainages are. So the Lower East Side advocates for flood protection for Lower East Side residents. We also advocate for maintenance of full funding to ensure safety of this project. We thank Council Member Rivera because there was a, a, a hearing here and one of the people spoke and at that point we then got uh, full funding. Uh, in, terms of say, uh, in terms of flood insurance, we understand that FEMA accreditation can impact flood insurance, rents, and carrying charges. We advocate for stabilization of affordable housing and no displacement of present residents. In terms of safety, uh, people are talking about different court cases. Well, the city was already taken to court by the disabled community. When electric power goes out, many disabled are severely affected. This is what was noted in the court, and the court sided with the disabled community and said the city had to do more. So they have already been taken to court, and it is absolutely disgusting for people to be barricaded in the apartments. Mm -hmm. So what this shows is uh, this is where they initially planned to do things, and these are the con ed lines. This is what they're saying they want to do now. We're advocating that whatever you do, get away from con ed lines, because it is not right to do the disabled in like that, because they do need uh, supplies. So the other picture, and then I will be done is of uh, the floodgates. 
and this is where it's open, this is where it's closed, this has to be done by a human uh, individual. Uh, we got a response from Deanne Griswold, the Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management, stating that New York City Emergency Management will assist in the coordination of deploying floodgates and other anti-flooding measures through the city's emergency operations center with our partners. Uh, we also support uh, Manhattan Community Board 6, uh, wanted robust social media strategy. We support that. And in terms of consultation, uh, uh, according to the action plan amendment, upon completion of the final design, uh, a registered professional engineer will certify. And we also received from the deputy director of DDC uh, that there's a commitment to using, using Envi Envision to assess this project when it's over. So we just, I, I guess for me as a former nurse, I'm like, I just think it's absolutely disgusting that 40 something people, was it 40? Um, that, oh God, let me just, that 43 city residents lost their lives. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about disabled people being barricaded in their homes. And we're talking about, let's do something about that. Um, so I, I guess for me, it's like, how do you go show people a picture like this? Here's your house, here's your house flooded. We have the money to do something. We have an approach to do something, but your life doesn't mean that much. And like I said, when they did another presentation, there is no such thing as an amount of money that you could put on somebody's life. Somebody told me about a cost-benefit analysis. I'm like, if somebody said that was your mother, what cost would you put? How much would you think her life would be worth? If that was your sister, if that was you, if that was your brother, how much money do you think the city should spend to protect their life? My mother, my sister, my brother, my family, my friends, I think their life is invaluable. Thank you. I think whatever money you have, you spend it to protect them. Thanks very much for your testimony. Thank you, panel, for your passion. Thank you for your time today. Claudia Bernstein, Greg, I believe it's Ryboloff, Kim Joyce, Toyce, Al Morales, and Kim Sillen. Alexis Adler, Olympia Kazi, or Razi, Olympia, and Ann Johnson. Okay, we cannot yield your time. We're going to have to have a slip for our speaker. Okay, then if he's in here, then we will call his name. Thank you. Billy. Co there is no time to be yielded, ma'am. Once, once we have a panel, we have a panel, and, the, and there's a clock on the panel. We did not yield any time for anyone in the session. We didn't yield any time for anyone. She spoke as one person and she had time on the clock for one person. Billy Cohen, Barbara August, Augsburger, 
Not here? Okay. And Andre, is it Dupuy? Okay. Mimi Milena Lezanicki, Mimi. Felicia Young. Okay, we'll go ahead with you, panel. You can start whenever you're ready. Hi, my name is Greg Rybalov. I live in Stuyvesant Town. My two children and myself are regular users of the park. My building on 23rd Street was flooded during Sandy, so I know firsthand the effects of the superstorm. Nonetheless, I am uh, completely opposed to the plan as it stands right now. Uh, first of all, it has very little coverage. Almost nobody uh, of my Stuyvesant Town neighbors have heard of the plan and, and they use the park all the time. This massive uh, undertaking is done surreptitiously, uh, more reminiscent of the Soviet Union where I came from than in advanced democracy. Secondly, when I moved to Stytown in 2000, the esplanade on the par in the East River Park was closed for repairs. And it was not until 2010 that the esplanade was reopened. So it was 10 years of closure for a simple repair of the esplanade. So now you say you will fix this, uh, you, you're gonna bury the park and build a new one and do sewer, uh, electrical and other lines in three and a half or five years. This uh, sounds completely unrealistic to me given uh, the speed with which projects take place in the city. Uh, I'm afraid it's gonna be decades before this thing is complete and uh, and another important fact is the money allocated about one and a half billion dollars for this plan right now is nothing in, in, is, is from, from what I can see in the city. I mean, uh, it's, it's, look at recent infrastructure costs. Uh, Tappan Zee Bridge, four billion dollars and, pro and probably another billion dollars uh, uh, over budget. Fulton Street uh, subway station, one and a half billion dollars, just one subway station. And then now we're, we're talking about whole park for one and a half billion dollars. It's almost three miles of waterfront. I mean, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be decades before it's going to be over. Thank you. Um, I support plans from East River. Alliance and East um, River Park Action. Uh, my daughter had a very bad case of asthma and almost didn't survive, which she contracted living in this neighborhood, in the neighborhood of Lower East Side, near the park. Uh, I don't believe the park should be buried under flat landfills. Um, even though it's higher, I think it should be hills. And I think there should be a, uh, an area of plants on the outside of the walls facing the river, the, the river walls. In layers, there should be, there should be plants, plants there um, be, to absorb all the, to soak up all kinds of extra water. And that's what they're doing in um, Boston and uh, they do things like that in Connecticut. And I don't see why we don't learn from other places that have some success with things like that. Um, I believe that uh, we'll lose, we could lose 60 to 80 species of local and migrating birds that will be uprooted and have life disrupted. Insects, and as I said, the plants. I'm a little worried because I just heard, and another thing I heard uh, mentioned that there was only a plan for sand, sand, clay, and gravel. What about soil amendments? I mean, and also the, the, the trees that are going to be uprooted, a lot of them can't be transplanted. They have very complex root systems. 
they can't, I'm a gardener, they, a lot of them won't survive. Um, we have uh, a lot of bird life, as I, I mentioned in this area. Um, oh, maybe that's my, is that my time? Okay. You're welcome. Hi, um, my name is Billy Cohen. I'm a Lower East Side resident for 40 years. Um, and th this project started as a design competition um, and it's been carried on as a design competition when it's really a giant engineering and drainage problem. Um, and they've just been showing aerial views, these beautiful aerial views to everybody. They never once showed what it looks like from the nitro doorways. They've never once showed from the street level. It, they've never once showed how these bridges and accesses are actually gonna work, adding eight feet high and making 80 accessible. There's no reality to much of what we're seeing. They're just making these beautiful images, which are a great marketing selling point, but where there's so much reality missing from what we know that I don't see how it could be voted on until it's understood, and I agree with this gentleman. I think the estimates are incredibly low, and I think the, um, the timeline, it took 10 years just to make a new, um, it took 10 years just to make a new boardwalk, so I mean, the timing that they're giving us and the, the amount of money is not real. Um, and also, it took this team, it took this design team four years to, um, it, while they were working four years on the design project, it took them four years to come out and say, oh, it wasn't viable. So now they're rushing through this next design bef to get money, the federal money before it's given up, the, before the timing is given up. Um, so I just think they're rushing through this and it's not realistic. They're changing very little drainage. Also, if there, Sandy was not a rain event. If there was a huge amount of rain at the same time, what's gonna happen to the drainage behind the wall? It can no longer get out. They're, they're making the pipes. The drainage is very insufficient on the whole Lower East Side. It floods on just minor rainstorms. And they're just fixing, as far as I understand, the drainage one block you know, behind the walls. But how's the water gonna escape? What if the drainage backs up? The sewers are insufficient. Um, there's so many questions, you know, that are not being answered. And are they doing this project as a low co bidding contract? Have they identified where this two miles of fill are coming from? Are they going to design this for another, you know, keep finalizing design and they don't even know, is, has anybody identified where all this fill is coming from? Are they going to wait till the contractor at the end and they make the contractor go find it? Like there's so many answers and questions that are not done and I hope the report that's reviewing the design is reviewing this from an engineering holistic approach because the whole coastline is one coast. And I've been to every community board meeting following the engineers out from DDC. And a lot of the questions I brought up from the beginning, they're going, oh, you're right, or you're right. I think there's a lot of real technical information that is not, they're not being transparent and that are not worked out. And they're just in a rush to get the federal funding, which is not gonna be enough. And all the other, this is one coast. Everywhere in Brooklyn, Manhattan, all the rest are getting beaches, boardwalks. How come we're getting eight feet of fill dumped on our park? It's not, it's just not. Thank you. It's not right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Andre Dupuy. I'm a lifetime New Yorker, American citizen and veteran. I find it a bit disingenuous that Councilman Powers, Rivera, and Chin are not here when it's no. their district. However. Rivera will be right back by the However. She just missed my testimony. The fact is, to say you're gonna save something by completely destroying it is boulder dash, to be polite. But paramount is to save human life from disaster. But if you looked at the time frame it took to build the seawall around the VA hospital, it took them four or five years. Now I say you should start building the seawalls where these people said most people were at risk of losing life. But the point I'm trying to make is, if we're building a seawall to 14th Street, and then we're resuming it after Collar's Hook, why are we not building a seawall all the way along, the whole way down? And so we come up with this cockamamie plan that we're gonna destroy the entire park and cover it with 10 feet of dirt. Now, there gotta be a compromise where you could then say, let's, the, 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 the huge trees by the amphitheater and the really big mature trees, you could probably have a wall there and then maybe build the, 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 like a levy somewhere else. But to say you gotta gut an entire park to save it is ridiculous, and it's just wrong. And I think the council members should vote against it unless they come up with a better plan. Oh, and another thing, you should have cost overruns, because if it took them so long to build that VA wall, what's to stop them from overrunning it? They, 
and that was only a quarter mile wall. It, they, these contractors should be held responsible for cost overruns and pay fines if they can't b meet the project deadlines. That should be written into the contracts right. before they even sign any paperwork. But they should build the walls first for the most dangerous areas where people already died and come up with a better plan and not destroy the, pre the trees one. And then one last thing, there's sea ravens besides all these other birds and then the butterflies and the plants and everything and the squirrels, they shouldn't destroy everything and, and say they're going to do it to save things. It's wrong. Vote no against it until a better plan comes up. Also, That's all I got to say. Also, Thank you very I, much. I do want to add. We have to move on. Thank I know, you. but there is, we they have do to need move. a wall to hold up the soil Thank you. along the FDR. Even okay. though they said there's no more pilings and they don't want to do the construction, how are they holding up the eight feet? They're going to need you. a wall along the FDR. Also. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, City Council. Um, I am Felicia Young. I'm the founder and director of Earth Celebrations, a nonprofit environmental arts organization on the Lower East Side since 1991, engaged with both community garden preservation and waterfront efforts for the past 30 years. The costume that you see here today is part of my creative testimony. This is a costume representing both the East River Park and the community vision for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan. It was created as part of the Ecological City Procession for Climate Solutions, which brought together all the amazing grassroots climate solution initiatives throughout the community gardens, neighborhood, and East River Park waterfront on the Lower East Side for the past two years. Um, one specific thing I would like to address is that this city plan is being presented without addressing how this new plan might relate to Mayor de Blasio's floated proposal to build a land extension on Lower Manhattan, presented as a flood barrier with waterfront development and some park land. I think many of you have probably read about this proposal and how does that impact and how do these plans relate to each other. We are asking the city council to reevaluate the most expensive redevelopment plans undertaken by New York City with a cohesive view of all various proposed waterfront redevelopment plans around Manhattan and neighboring boroughs that are equally impacted by climate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you all for your time today and your testimony. Thank you. Quick sub for council member and chair Adams who has been doing a brilliant job in moving us along. We are human after all and we do need a bio break. I hope you'll be gracious enough to allow us. So the next panel is Santos Rodriguez, Joe Colella, Joe Colella, Joseph Colella. I mean, that's very coincidental. Maisha Morales. Dan Myers, Stephen Albos, and f forgive me, uh, you can correct um, my pronunciation. As someone who gets their name mispronounced, I'm, I welcome the correction. Also, Kenneth Koloski, is Kenneth here? Mr. Koloski? Is Maya Chaffee here, Chafe? M Maya Chafe, no? From 91 East 3rd? Harriet Hershorn? And is Lenore Goldstein here? Lenore Goldstein. Marie de Seneval.
<clears throat> good afternoon uh, or good evening. My name is Maisha Morales. I am a community activist, advocate, organizer, uh, formerly an employee of, as of last week, good old Lower East Side. I want to make it clear that I am not here speaking on behalf of the organization, but as someone who worked tirelessly for eight years in that community, serving especially senior citizens and the most vulnerable NYCHA public housing residents. Um, I was there during Hurricane Sandy as a, with, with my former boss, Damaris Reyes, Councilwoman Rivera during that time was a colleague, and we were there on the ground organizing, making sure, responding, and making sure we can help the residents, especially the mo those most in need, which were seniors who were trapped in their buildings. Uh, because I worked with the senior population, those were the ones we reached out to first. I lost three of my senior clients during Hurricane Sandy uh, through the gas explo Con Ed explosion, which caused a heart attack and my senior died. Uh, one of them who had no access to dialysis because she couldn't get down. And then there's a personal connection with my aunts and my two developmentally disabled cousins who lived right on the, by the FDR in, in NYCHA who were displaced. Um, I'm very upset that the city totally disregarded the community's plan where goals, other organizations, but especially community residents uh, alongside Real Rebuild by Design created this plan and the mayor and what other, other agencies were involved totally disregarded them. And uh, I believe that they owe this community a public apology. This is why uh, residents, uh, constituents don't trust government. And so going forward, they owe a public apology. I do wanna say that in the end, flood protection is needed. I'm not sure which plan is the best plan, but flood protection is needed, especially for the most vulnerable, which are NYCHA public housing residents. And I'm not hearing their voices heard. So I am here today speaking on their behalf, on behalf of my family, my clients, and all of public housing across the Lower East Side. I, if the independent consult, I ask that you guys, before making your decision, wait for the independent consultant's review uh, if it turns out that the mayor's plan is better, whatever plan is better, we need to make sure that public housing residents and other residents' uh, voices and ideas are included in this. Okay, but in the end, we do need flood protection, uh, especially for public housing residents who are the first ones hit and still suffering from this, the impact. And one last thing, because it's important, there has been misinformation going around where I have residents calling me, my own family saying, they're gonna privatize NYCHA, what's going on? You are scaring the people, and this goes for organizers who are out there, and I get it. I really get why it's important, saving the ecosystem, all of it is important, but you cannot organize, especially my community, okay, with misinformation. So going forward, I hold the community accountable as well as the city accountable in making sure that voices are included and that the correct information is provided. Thank you. Thank you. I find this a moment, hopefully lasting, in which the council will turn the page. My name is Daniel Myers, a resident of Avenue C on the Lower East Side, and for 30 years, a near daily guest of the East River Park. I've attended the hearings leading to today's proceedings. I have testified. I have reviewed reports, findings, concerns, and reservations by prior governmental bodies. They add up to a clarion call. For this decisional body, the City Council of the City of New York, to reject the city's $1.45 billion plan, a project which requires the complete demolition of the East River Park, a public sanctuary. CB3, in June of 2019, issued a report. 
To me, it stands as a source for defeating the city's plan. It makes findings about the existence of substantial defects in the city's plan, including adverse harm to humans, the ecology and environment. The serious public health threats, these serious public health threats cry out for this body, the city council, to reject outright the city's plan and make an affirmation of the council's commitment to the, to the health and well-being of its constituents. Selections from CB3 with regard to the serious problems that the plan has. And you can look at it, it includes natural resources, the complete and total destruction of all trees, plants, insect habitats, and zone tidal wetlands, hazardous materials. The proposed city project would dis disturb the subsurface of hazardous materials where contaminants could be disturbed during evacuations and excavations. Just please wrap up, Tim. Please wrap up. What's that? Please wrap up. You just wrapped me up. No, I'm saying please wrap up. The bell went off. Yes, I stopped. Oh. Would you like me to stop? I stopped. No, just please finish okay. your last thought. Uh, let me, okay, let me leave this gentler notion, but nonetheless particularly applicable. It was produced by the Ancient Forests and Champion Trees part of what is called Natural Wonders. What does it mean to destroy every tree in that park? Every day, a 40-foot tree takes in 50 gallons of dissolved nutrients from the soil, raises this mixture to its topmost leaves, converts it into 10 pounds of carbohydrates, and here, which is of particular importance, releases about 60 cubic feet of pure oxygen into the air. It's the only pure oxygen we have living on the Lower East Side, and they want to take out 981 oxygen-producing blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We Thank just have you. 20 more people signed up, so I want to make sure that we're getting through this Absolutely. two minutes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Albanese, and I'm with the Municipal Art Society of New York. Oh. MAS believes that ESCR should set a standard for how long-term, large-scale resiliency projects are planned, coordinated, and implemented in New York City and elsewhere. While we recognize the challenges of coordinating a project of this magnitude, protecting the East River community requires more thorough, efficient, and engaged planning than has occurred thus far. While we are pleased with the announcement that project construction will be phased, this significant last minute change speaks volumes about the need for better planning. ESCR must include more adequate mitiga mitigation measures to address impacts during construction, details on how the project would integrate with other coastal resiliency plans, and true community input in its planning and design. The importance of East River Park, surrounding playgrounds, and river access cannot be overstated. The area is grossly underserved by open space with only a third of the city average. 21% of area residents are below poverty level and 17% are elderly. We maintain that the city work with NYCHA, community groups, and nonprofits on a more comprehensive, long-term plan for new open space after ESCR is complete. The FEIS does not adequately address our concerns about how the fireboat house will be preserved during construction whether it would be used during this time or after project completion, and how it would be protected from flooding in the future. We expect these and other concerns to be addressed in a revised FEIS. Because of their shared purpose, proximity, and permitting and construction timelines, MAS believes that ESCR and LMCR should be evaluated together. This effort should address connectivity of the waterfront esplanade, infrastructural tie-in points, cumulative impacts, and comparative levels of flood protection. Finally, as we have maintained throughout the process, the success of ESCR will depend on how well the city engages with the community and responds to its needs. MAS agrees with recommendations from the Manhattan Borough President that a task force be formed to coordinate this effort. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> um, 
I'm speaking for myself and my neighbors. The ESCR project in its current form is cruel and immoral. We live right I'm here. I'm sorry, can you just say your name? Harriet Hirshhorn. Sorry. We live right here and stand to lose everything, including our lives, and we know the seas are rising, and we know about storm surge events and we, uh, that we experienced firsthand. And yet we hate the city's preferred alternative and still, for the life of us, cannot figure out what about it makes it so preferred and by who exactly. As has been said by so many, as, as by, um, I'm trying to make it shorter. Uh, this plan seems designed to punish the people it professes to protect. It also seems designed by people who have no idea what it is like to live here in a floodplain threatened by all aspects of climate change in a densely populated, diverse urban environment amidst runaway construction and skyrocketing rents. By focusing on such a limited definition of climate change, floods, this plan inflicts damage on, com on communities that live along the water, increases temperatures in this downtown area, makes the air we breathe worse, and further impairs our physical and mental health that we struggle so hard to maintain. Those of you who do live here know how precious little bits of nature are to us. We are, for the most part, alienated from nature in our concrete jungle, and many of us face challenges. But in the East River Park, an oasis that has brought immeasurable joy to at least four generations and still does, we see a leaf spin down from the sky and fall to the ground and it seems like a miracle. We stare at the water and feel the wind on our cheeks and we feel wonder. We see the monarchs right now hovering over fluffy looking flowering pods and we keep taking pictures of them. We can still love what we may not be able to name. So why are we being told? by rep our representatives to quote un un unquote swallow this bitter pill. Why are we being asked to sacrifice our health and well-being when the purpose here is really the filling of pockets rather than the best flood protection for our communities? With all the passion, creativity, and knowledge that our city is famous for, we believe you can do much better than this. It's hard to come after you, Harriet. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Marie de Senival. Uh, I'm a French citizen, but I've been living here since uh, 12 years. I'm a, a daily user of uh, the park and a lover of the park. I'm a human rights worker. Um, climate change is real, um, and protection from storm surge and sea rise is needed. Uh, this we all know. Who doesn't say that today? But what you're not being asked uh, for today is you know, you're not going to be asked to vote for or against for flood protection. That's not the subject here, really. What the subject here is, what is at stake, at stake is a vision and especially a method, the method that the city of New York has used to conduct the most emblematic resiliency project uh, for a very emblematic city. What's at stake really is uh, environmental justice. I'm going to explain why others have done before, but we echo each other. There was a rebuild by design process. For four years, people went to workshops, and they really, really engaged truly with a team of architects. Um, they were led to believe uh, that they could be part of decision making. They were led to believe that they counted. Uh, they've been listened to at some point. Uh, the people most at risk of flooding us uh, we said we did not want to be cut off from the water. He said we wanted minimum destruction of our park at every workshop for many years. You can read the conclusion in the Rebuilt by Design study report. They said we prefer the berm along the FDR. And they were heard. The consensus plan that was called before it was first modified by the parks and buried by the city was beautiful with its curves and its promenade overlooking the river. It was resilient. It involved less destruction, only one third of the trees. It articulated flood protection with concerns for the environment. It was a plan for our time, a time to be mindful rather than wasteful, a time for climate emergency. And then boom, the plan is taken away from us, a new design is imposed for reasons still undocumented Carlina, we haven't seen that, that study about constructability. It's Please still wrap nowhere. up. Um, 
it's a $1 billion boondoggle. I'm quoting Senator Holman, Kavanaugh, and Epstein here. It's unnecessary, it's destructive, it's expensive. And since that day, we, the people, we have spent hours, hours and hours studying, researching, writing to elected officials. We have posted more than 200 comments to a sham environmental impact statement. We have gathered more than 5,000 signatures, my, marched by the hundreds against this plan, lost days in our lives to speak two minutes and a half, thank you, uh, at six different hearings and town halls so far, where the vast majority and sometimes the whole room opposed the preferred option. This is now the seventh. Mm -hmm. We feel used, betrayed, and tired. And this too will have an exorbitant cost I hope the city council will restore our belief in democracy and that one day we can work again with the city to update alternative number three, our preferred alternative. Please oppose this disgraceful initiative that is imposed by force on the very people that it pretends to protect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel, for your time. Thank you for sticking it out with us this afternoon. Thank you. Very good. Mariah, Mariah Stancaron, Elizabeth Dysegard, Robert Fink. He's uh, not here. Thank you. Sorry. Wendy Brower. She's not here. Pat Arno. Jen, I should spell it. That's it. <laughs> Howard Branstein. Danielle, is it Atu? Chu, Danielle. Tom O'Keefe. Christine Rome Mar Romero. Christine. All right, we got five. Thank you. Panel, you may begin. <clears throat> the city's proposed preferred plan for resiliency may work for many purposes. Please state your name for the record. I'm Mariah Stancarone um, mm -hmm. with East River Park Action. Just remind me if I forget. The city's preferred plan for resiliency may work for many purposes, but it cannot work ecologically for East River Park, much less for our river, which needs to have its shoreline released to receive, absorb, and return through thoughtful remediation, the cyclic, cyclical, ebb and flow of its waters. Plan three, reclaim the shore and allow East River Park with its vital ecosystems already in place stay a large part of east side coastal resiliency by being true to its name. It was hammered out over years by the residents, civic leaders, institutions, along with the city, agencies, and departments. Until early 2019, which finds us, which finds all that work and heart discarded nullifying its existence on paper and in fact. We argued in good faith. We need to reclaim, we need to reclaim and should save the most vital and important document created by two such opposing 
bodies as a municipality and its affected folks. Respect its relevance, this document, which is Plan 3, in the next years so we can remember the rightness of it. My name is Pat Arno, and I'm with East River Park Action. Thank you so much for listening to us today and for staying through this long day. I really appreciate your listening. The East Side Coastal Resiliency Plan for East R River Park is meant to protect us from the unfortunate consequences of climate change, storm surges, and rising sea levels. Paradoxically, the current plan is so environmentally destructive that it will contribute to climate change. A massive construction project with eight to 10 feet of landfill over 57 acres takes far more energy and resources than developing a floodable, resilient coastline and flood protection along the FDR. One uh, thing, uh, uh, Commissioner Grillo's reason for changing the plan a major reason was to eliminate years of nighttime pile driving along the FDR. That's so they didn't have to close a lane of the FDR during the day. That is taking cars over community, and I think we should, should take community over cars. Close the lane and do it during the day. Demolishing the living park with filled with greenery, playing fields, and a thousand mature trees robs us of cleansing and cooling air and mental health benefits and physical benefits of our densely populated, modest income neighborhood. A staff member of a key city council member tried to persuade me that demolishing the park was not significant in the greater world of climate change. He told me, and I quote, 900 trees does not a clean earth make. I want to quote Sean Donovan, HUD secretary in the Obama administration. Part of Rebuild by Design was saying every department in your government is a resiliency department, whether it's sanitation or parks. Every one of them has the power through the accumulation of a million small decisions to make the city more resilient. We can create a culture of resilience. What I'm asking is give us true resilience, not a so-called resiliency plan that will further imperil the Earth's climate. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jen Jantana Pichier. I'm the program director at Sixth Street Community Center in the Lower East Side. I also have a master's in urban planning where I focus on community-based planning, so bottom-up planning as opposed to top-down planning, um, and in urban sustainability. Um, I wanted to say that Amy Burkov uh, shared some words from Letitia James. I also wanted to share those same words, but I have the written um, critique from Letitia James if you are interested in reviewing it. So the revised uh, ESCR plan is not ecologically grounded in my opinion. It will still destroy the natural flood barrier, nearly 1,000 trees, and all of the biodiversity that lives in our park. The nearly 60-acre 60 60 park in its current state is fully thriving. East River Park supports the mental and physical well-being of our community residents, the overall ecology of our city, and it currently mitigates the impacts of climate change and overheating as it reduces greenhouse gases. The city is failing us. They are failing to recognize that phased construction doesn't change the level of destruction to the park. The environmental injustices that will be posed to the Lower East Side community or the fact that they aren't actively including aspects of the plan that will mitigate climate change. Our city wants to be a leader in addressing the climate crisis, but our city plans aren't progressive enough. The city's ESCR plan does not include any urban sustainability solutions that address the root causes of climate change, nor does it address the environmental injustices that will be posed to the majority low-income communities of color that live along the F alongside the FDR Drive and East River Park. Many of, the, many of these same residents have lived with impaired health since 9-11, exacerbated by roadway emissions from the highway adjacent to their homes. The community has been petitioning for a plan that is environmentally just, a plan that reflects the considerations for the quality of life and health of the 110,000 residents that will be impacted. The community spoke, but the city is pretending to listen by trying to placate us with his phased construction plan. 
I agree the city needs to adapt and become more resilient to climate change. However, with 1.5 billion allocated for this project, the city has the resources to develop an ecologically grounded plan that can provide sensible flood protection while mitigated mitigating the causes of climate change induced flooding. How about expanding the park with decking over the FDR drive and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by re-envisioning the FDR as a mass transit corridor to a mass transit desert that will also serve the residents of the Lower East Side. Instead, the city plans to keep in place a car-centric vision from the last century and a false promise of safety behind an eight-foot wall of landfill that will inevitably become massive shrine to the automobile and fossil fuel industry. New York City has the opportunity to be a leader in developing a resilient plan that confronts the climate crisis, but they aren't doing that. Thank you. I urge you guys as elected officials to really consider, to be really bold, to demand better for our city and to be actually resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much. Howard Branstein, I'm the executive director of Sixth Street Community Center. We've been uh, in existence for over 40 years. During Hurricane Sandy and after, we served thousands of community residents with emergency food, water, clothing, and other needs. The current ESCR plan is not really a flood protection plan. It's a traffic protection plan. The city is prepared to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to stop us in any way from interrupting traffic on the FDR drive. A plan that fails to connect climate-induced flooding with climate change is not really a plan. And no amount of dirt can be piled high enough to keep our community safe from flooding under those kinds of circumstances. We have to look at the source of greenhouse gas emissions, which, as many people have pointed out, is the FDR drive with its 100,000-plus cars traveling north and south every day. The city's plan, whether it's phased or unfazed, is simplistic. It's really a form of Trump think, and it offers us a false sense of security, like a doctor who treats a patient for lung cancer, removes the patient's lung, and then prescribes more smoking. That patient won't live very long, and I don't think a plan that doesn't address climate change will ensure longevity for our community. The community plan that many people have spoken about is actually an ecological plan, and I have attached to my testimony the, th the names of the 300 people and 10 planning and design firms that assisted in developing this plan. It's part of the Rebuild by Design report that came out uh, last year. So we're in favor of a flood plan building a wall for flood protection, a berm along the FDR drive, using the monies that we saved on the earlier plan, which were far less expensive, to do the decking that many people have spoken about, and also to seriously re-envision the FDR drive, as Council Member Rivera has also talked about, as a, a greening project, or in what we suggest, a mass transit corridor. So let's combat climate change and provide flood, flood protection and give the community some hope and provide a direction and a model for other communities in New York City and beyond. Thank you. All right, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christina Dutz Romero, and I'm the executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center, and I'd like to thank uh, the council for sitting through this testimony. As you can hear, uh, we are a community that has been certainly engaged in a lot of meetings, but we also have a feeling we haven't been heard. Uh, the uh, city's concession to now do a phased plan is by no way um, going to pacify uh, our concerns and it's not addressing all the questions that we still have about this plan. And from uh, the uh, perspective of an um, organization that uh, I have uh, fostered in this park and that had play has played a tremendous role in stewarding the park and bringing public programming to the park, I'm just really um, disappointed that uh, I'm still sitting here a year later asking really uh, not having any 
any answers to my basic question. If you're really raising this park, what is going to happen to a building that you cannot raise? And um, I have asked this in every community board meeting, in every city council hearing, and we just don't have any answers. And that's emblematic of the process because the city has really bullied their way with this plan. They have not listened to anybody and they have um, given us a thousand presentations, but you know, any input that, uh, and any ideas that we have, there is nothing really reflected in that plan, and I think that is not fair for, uh, for a community who uh, really wants to see a plan that works for everyone, and um, I hope that uh, the city council is going to wait until we really reach a point where people's voices and concerns are heard and where we can really come up with a plan that works for uh, everyone. Climate change is real, and this plan right now, as it stands, just puts gasoline on the fire. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for sticking it out with us this afternoon. Thank you for your testimony, and especially thank you for your passion. Yvette Mercedes. She's here. She's here. Okay. I think we had Lucy already. Lucy Cotine, we had Lucy already. Ali Ryan. Sam Moskowitz. Charles Krizel. Is there a Bryce? From Coalition of, might be the Coalition of the Rockaways. Oh, yes, she's not here anymore. See? Mm -hmm. Is Kate Horsfield still here? I think Miss Horsfield left. And Rena Anastasi. If I haven't called your name and you're still here waiting to testify, it's because we have not received a white slip. Please fill one out as we are coming to the end of our hearing. Is Yvette Mercedes here? Okay, panel, you may begin. Thank you. My name is Allie Ryan, and I, also, I first want to thank Councilmember Rivera for sending out your newsletter earlier this week, because that was the only way I knew about today's subcommittee hearing, and I passed it out to lots of my friends and neighbors. My husband has lived in Alphabet City for almost 30 years. We have lived in our apartment at the corner of 11th and C, for 20 years. Our daughters attend a District 1 elementary school. <sighs> never, never, um, our building was directly affected by Hurricane Sandy's floodwaters, rose to our building's first floor doorknobs, so four feet, it, the waters came to four feet at the corner of 11, on 11th and C. My first, floor neighbors, my first floor neighbors lost everything and had to rebuild their homes from studs. 
Nevertheless, my family opposes the ESCR's current proposal and version three, but I also, we also, I also oppose version four. Um, we cannot imagine one summer without East River Park, much less four summers. This proposal is obviously primarily meant to protect the FDR from flooding. I, this past summer, I biked my daughters to East River Park for free parks department, free sports classes, four days a week, specifically entering at East River Park's East 18th Street entrance. This proposal does not address the curve from 18th Street to the Con Ed bottleneck part of the pedestrian slash bike path. The flybridge does not address this bend. The FDR will flood due to this flaw in its design. In addition, the gas station, uh, the parking garage in Eunice is not addressed in the new plan. Flooding will still continue. And just, I'll wrap it up. Um, if Mayor de Blasio's team ra is radical to propose a plan to raise an actively used 68, sorry, 58 acre public park, then you can radically, radically dismantle the Robert Moses FDR and re redesign it for the 21st century. Close the FDR, redesign, rebuild the FDR, or dismantle the FDR. Use the FDR as a flood wall for our neighborhood. Preserve the East River Park as a National Historic Site since it was conceived almost 100 years ago as a, F a WPA project. The Parks Department buildings and wrought iron pillars are exquisite classic examples of Art Deco architecture. And finally, remember when FD, oh, sorry, remember when East River Park was renovated year, um, years ago that was dedicated to those children who lost parents in the 9-11 tax. And then finally, I'd like to end with what my daughters told me this morning when I told them I was coming here today. They said, what about the Lorax? <laughs> and they said, the Lorax speaks for the trees. So I encourage you to, to find a copy of the Lorax and read it as you go forth. Thank you. Thank you. I know the Lorax well. I have grandchildren. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam Moskowitz. I'm a fifth generation Lower East Side resident. I live at 25 Montgomery Street and I'm on the board of Gouverneur Gardens. Most of our almost 800 apartments sit on Water Street just a block from the river. Since Sandy, our annual flood insurance premiums have increased almost $500,000. We cannot afford this as 84% of our residents are below area median income. We need flood protection and we need it now. But the ESCR does not include any protection until at least the 2023 hurricane season. Where is our temporary protection? I am disgusted by this administration's strategy of dividing and conquering this neighborhood with the false dichotomy of flood protection versus the park in a zero sum, winner take all showdown. Between all the rhetoric and fear mongering and anecdotal evidence we've all heard today on both sides of the argument, there is a solution. I don't know what the solution is, but I don't think it's what the city is telling us is. We need fl both flood protection and we need the park. We have been offered a take it or leave it option with no transparency. The city has still not provided a real answer about why the original plan was discarded. While the area south of us gets a panel of 18 expert consultants, our ESCR was developed in a backroom deal by our ethically dubious part-time mayor's political appointees. I am also the PTA treasurer at my children's school, PS 184, a Title I school of 700 students at the corner of the FDR Drive at Montgomery Street. The environmental impact statement ignores the negative impacts on air quality via the demolition of the park, the unknown number of truck trips in and out of the construction zone, and the dumping of hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of landfill. While barges are being touted as environmentally friendly, they will still dump many tons of noxious pollutants into the air breathed by our vulnerable seniors and children. Clearly, the city has failed in their efforts to develop the best plan for our community, and we deserve the best. Thank you. My name is Charles Grizel. I'm with Lungs, which is Low East Side of United Neighborhood Gardens. Um, 
I first heard about this uh, project, the new, the new deal back in December of last year. I went to uh, two uh, public uh, presentations by the city administration on December 10th and December 11th. At that time, I asked them, please do not close this park uh, totally. Uh, please do it in stages because the kids cannot, um, it, it's not fair to the kids in the neighborhood to close the parks. At that time, I was told uh, that's totally impossible. We cannot do that. And this plan is going to go ahead. The ship has already sailed. Come to yesterday, the cynical administration of the city in a political, obviously political deal before this hearing has come up and said, oh, we can do phasing now. We're going to be helping you. They've never worked with us. We've had to fight for them to give us any kind of an information about this project. And it feels like uh, we're being squeezed by the city. I think that the city is not looking at the people in this neighborhood, as, but rather as as um, not as individuals or as citizens, but as someone's people who can be exploited. I really believe that this uh, plan is an alienation of parkland, which is against state law. If the city goes ahead with this project, we're gonna bring a lawsuit against the city to pro stop this project. There's plenty of people who are supporting that. There's plenty of people on the state level that believe that's, a pro that's the state law. So that's where we're gonna go with this. We're not gonna stop. Thank you. Is it still on? Hi, my name is Rena Anastasi and I've been a resident of the Lower East Side for at least 25 years. And when I first heard about the plan to rip out the park, um, I found it really upsetting. I use it a lot also, and um, it's a very calming, peaceful place. And I observe all the people that go there, <clears throat> the children and the boys that play in the fields and tennis and everything. I mean, it's, I've always described it as one of the most beautiful parks. Um, I do understand that there is an issue with the flooding situation, and I were here also during Hurricane Sandy. I mean, the waters didn't get to where I live, though, you know, the power failure and no cell, act, you know, all that was affected where I lived as well. Um, it seems as though th there's some deep, misunderstanding, miscommunication, something deeply missing with this um, plan and the way it's been brought in sort of quickly-ish, considering there was one previously that had been going on for a few years where the people, the community was very involved in. So I can totally understand that people were really upset about this new idea that's you know, so expensive, and then only yesterday the, the idea to, um, I guess, you know, do it in heart, like not completely rip out the park, which was completely horrifying to majority of us, I would say. I've heard everybody speak here, and I've heard professionals speak of like what they know in science and ecology and everything, and I'm not one of them, but I can understand. So it, it does seem a bit suspicious, basically. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your time, panel. We know that the hour has drawn over the past few hours, and you stuck it out with us, and we really do appreciate your testimony. And yes, we did listen. Thank you so much. Did Miss Mercedes ever return to Chambers? She left. OK, thank you very much. I've already asked for any more members of the public, and seeing none, I now close today's public hearing. All items are laid over. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the public, especially the members of the public, once again for toughing it out with us for this very, very passionate hearing today. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Council Member Rivera, Chin, and Powers especially, Council and Land Use staff for attending today's hearing and all of their dedication to this work today. This meeting is hereby adjourned.